and it's a great pleasure to now welcome for our third speaker, uh, Laura Marin from JPIMR um, on past and future research priorities towards One Health AMR. Hello, good morning, everyone. A pleasure to be here with all of you today. And uh, I'm just going to be talking more about funding on the AMR landscape and about research funding, you know. And um, so uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, so in GPIMR is basically an intergovernmental organization. And what we do is to bring the ministries of research and health from different countries together to agree and discuss about what are the research priorities and what each country is funding in the IMR field and what are we doing together globally, internationally. So basically we advocate that all the national plans on IMR that now every single country in the world is actually having, that they also include a research program together with it, with resources allocated on what are those key um, elements and most important areas that need each different country. Um, just, just, just before getting started, really, what we are talking about research on IMR, just to try to uh, a bit contextualize what we are talking about, I mean, this morning. So what is what we are talking about IMR? We're we talking about antimicrobial resistance. As Mark was saying earlier today, is about when we are running out of therapeutics options. And that is what actually is happening. We are not really talking here about the burden, but the burden of IMR is bigger than combining TB, malaria, and HIV. So it's really a critical um, element. So we really need to look at that. It's not only that we are running out of therapeutic options, we are also do not have the knowledge of understanding of why is increasing the resistance? What are the drivers? What can we do to reduce the spread, the transmission of resistance? How, and we are not only talking about humans, animals is also running out of therapeutic options. You know, if we look at Africa, for example, more than 50%, between 50 and 70% of all the cattle that is raised dies before it's a slaughter. So animals are also sick. So we have also a problem of food security. If we are raising animals that at the end cannot be um, utilized. And also in many countries, we know that there's three more times uh, antibiotics in the waters that also is prescribed to humans. So what is this? What does it mean that there's all this resistance in the environment, in our rivers, in the water that we're drinking? Do we, we don't really know what is the risk to us, how this transmission has occurred in the first place. So when we talk about one health approach, that is what we're talking about, how we can have all these different tools to help us and to make the current antibiotics work because there's no new antibiotics out there. You know, the last generation of antibiotics were discovered in the 80s. And at the moment, the pipeline is basically empty. We have in clinical development about four candidates. So it's really nothing. So we are really in a scenario that that's why it's very important implementation research that we've been listening to the speakers this morning, because we really need to make sure that the current antibiotics that we have and the current antimicrobials are working in the next years, because there's no new things out there. So in this political context, that's why the different countries have come together to see, okay, we need to really try to find more about um, about uh, IMR, and we need to try to develop new evidence that we can develop new policies that can ensure us all this. So it's basically at the moment, 29 countries, and I'm happy that uh, most of them are high income countries because there's countries with the available budgets to able to mobilize on it. But we're also happy to have countries like uh, Chile, Argentina, South Africa, or Egypt also in the, in the group. In the next slide, I would, uh, you would be able to see what we are talking about. When you bring people together from different countries, it's very important that we agree on common research objectives, common research priorities that this is what we are going to be funding. So this is very important. It has been a long exercise really to make people agree, to listen to everyone different needs, to be able to have a list of research priorities that are going to be deployed through different funding mechanisms in the year. So as you can see here, this is the um, priorities that we have got in the last uh, seven years, which is very much in the area of therapeutics, diagnostics, um, interventions, transmission, environment. 
And, and you will see this afternoon, we are going to talk about uh, research priorities, the exercise that the WHO and the quadripartite are doing, and we're also working to get with them to update those research priorities. I will talk this a bit later. In the next slide, please, we will be able to see what we have been funding in the last year. So we've been mobilizing about uh, 140 million euros in the last seven years, and we have been trying to support research in all the different areas of our priorities and also emphasizing those projects who has a more one health approach. But as you can see, we don't only support researchers in our member countries, these 29 member countries at the moment, but also we are able together collaborating with developing aid agencies to support researchers in a lower middle income countries. So that's, as you can see in the map, we are supporting researchers in 77 countries worldwide. So this is important to us to see how we can really create transnational collaboration to create international research networks that are really inclusive uh, globally and can bring all the different needs and we can cover all the different gaps in creating these new evidence tools. In the next slide, please, we will um, talking about the distribution of this funding that we have done globally. The, the importance on how we fund uh, internationally is very much to see also what is being funded nationally. So we do, we do analyze which research is going on at national level and where are the gaps and where is the value added that we can, that is necessary to create international and transnational collaboration. So we will be funding heavily in the area of transmission to try to understand, to try to be able to mitigate IMR uh, especially and, and also to start to create a new scientific capacity in the area, for example, of water research has been a new field, for example. So we are also trying to build new scientific communities to be able to address those knowledge gaps. In the next slide, please. Um, um, I just put you some examples of uh, projects that we've been funding in, in Africa and, and Asia, just to see that in all our uh, collaborations, we always try to have this international consortia you know, with uh, countries, you know, from the, from the North Hemisphere, from the South Hemisphere, really trying to create this collaboration together in different contexts. So this is just a few examples of the type of projects that we've been uh, uh, funding. In the next slide, please, uh, we have some, an example, just to see, because this can be a bit abstract, right? So for example, in the surveillance networks that we've been funding, you, you can see here the composition of those networks. So it's really trying to really bring people together all across. And, um, and we hope that there is more presence of the global half research researchers in those networks, which has uh, granted six new, new networks in surveillance on Friday. And um, I'm happy to say that there's 20, 20, no, sorry, 230 new researchers, which are going to be part of this network so that we will be able to add it to this slide. So this is like happy news to get more of these networks ongoing to look at harmonization and, and uh, how to improve and enhance surveillance systems globally. In the next slide, please. Yes. And just want to, to talk about, okay, we've been talking about the past, about the future. So we are launching every year, we launch a call every January. So our call that we're going to launch next year in January is on uh, diagnostics and surveillance. It's, it's two major fields of work. I'm very happy to say that uh, South Africa will be funding this call too. So happy that South Africa does some fun every year, but I was I was this week with representatives of the Medical Research Council and the government, so happy that they are committed to, to fund this area. And we are also going to have some developing aid funding that we will also be able to fund researchers in the least developed countries in Africa. So I'm, I'm happy to be able to, to see this going, to hope, uh, looking forward, these applications that we are going to be having in this area. Also, it's the first time that Australia is going to be uh, funding uh, together with us in our call. So it's also getting Australia on board. That's an important element. And just to say that in January, there will be some webinars and some brokerage events uh, to try to find partners and to bring people together to prepare the applications. So please check our website and, and, and see all what is going to be going on in, in January. And to finalize, I'm going to be talking in the next slide about a more long-term future. So basically, 
uh, we are updating our new research, joint research program that will start in 2025. And now we're identifying which are the areas that we're going to be focusing our efforts, which is going to be three areas, as you can see. So on, on development of, of uh, effective antimicrobials are and also alternatives and also this um, regarding mitigation. So it's about understanding this transmission mechanism in the One Health approach and to try to uh, fit this evidence and translate into implementation research at the end that we can see these solutions on the field. And finally, in the last slide, uh, just to tell you that we've been having a very inclusive consultation process to identify exactly which should be these specific research areas and research objectives that we are going to be funding in the future. Uh, we have been having a lot of um, uh, consultations online. We were happy to see researchers from all over the world providing their feedback. And we also been doing this in parallel together with the uh, WHO and the Quadripartite in the development of the research priorities. Important to say that the, by the 1st of December, we will launch the open consultation on these priorities worldwide. And we are very happy to also to get also your input to it. So, and I just want to advocate for all of you to provide your input of what do you think are those needed gaps? What is this most needed in what we really need to direct the future funding? You know, if you provide your voice, in this online consultation, this will be uh, very significant on what we are going to be funding in the next year. So it's now that we need to, you need to raise your voice uh, to be listened for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was wonderful and uh, great work that JPMR are doing. Um, Okay, it, uh, the last speaker gave me great pleasure to introduce him. I've known him for 59 years, and it's myself. So, uh, apologies. Um, I'm too big for the screen, you see, can't even get. Okay, I'm gonna speak like this now. Okay. Um, uh, are you, can I, can I, yeah. Okay, so I, I we're going to, I'm going to take a slightly different angle to this. Um, uh, speaking with Delphine, I was asked to really try and understand whether our research priorities, when we're thinking about implementation research and our research priorities, you know, where should we really be? Uh, where are we getting our bang, bang for our buck? Where should we, particularly as the Global South, be um, be directing our funding to and our our priorities? So when we think about uh, the the One Health nature of AMR, it's dizzyingly complex and problematic, and you can make good cases for everything being a priority. But at some stage, we have to prioritize, particularly as low income countries, because we just don't have funding to put in studies in every uh, and uh, uh, implementation in every area. So we need to decide where that number one, you know, what sits in that number one, both important and urgent. Well, we've got priority pathogen lists for bacteria. We've got priority pathogen lists now for fungi, so why not priority pathogen or priority lists for AMR mitigation interventions? So the WHO have provided this very useful strategic priority framework for um, antimicrobial resistance, and that you know includes the stepping up of leadership, the driving of health uh, impact, the research and development, and monitoring, of course. And interestingly, in that governance, the, the quote, to develop a common vision alignment and purpose, shared accountability among stakeholders. So I want to, just, want to just touch now on this common vision. Where is it a common vision? Because the elephant in the room is that the, in my, to my mind, the core unmet needs in AMR implementation to mitigate AMR are not, not, not the same in the global north and the global south. They're not aligned at the moment. And why is that? Well, Antibiotic use drives antibiotic resistance in a, on a, a country level and regionally within the high income countries of the global north, whereas the social determinants of infection, those things which um, high income countries have been able to mitigate through their ability to, to change the social determinants of infectious diseases, which includes poverty and uh, various other things that I'm going to touch on. Um, have not are not being enjoyed by low middle income countries. So in this slide, you can see on the left, the direct relationship in European countries, with the amount of penicillin that's used and the amount of resistance in streptococcus pneumoniae. 
when you start taking low middle income countries into uh, into effect in terms of the middle study by Collingham and colleagues, um, that relationship, that direct relationship actually disappears. And what they found looking at a variety of different indices, which themselves each had a variety of different factors in play, is that your greatest bang for buck in reducing antimicrobial resistance in low middle income countries is actually in the interventions and the infrastructure. So water and clean water and safe sanitation, vaccination programs, in other words, reducing the burden of infection. So if you reduce the burden of infection, you reduce the people going to try and access antibiotics. Similarly, in an extremely good study on the metagenomics in sewage, um, there was again found a real difference, the highest amount of AMR genes, or antimicrobial resistance genes, bacterial genes is in low middle income countries, in the continents in Africa, South America, and, and Asia. Um, and again, what was the major driver? The major driver was the, well, the um, uh, health, sorry, what was it called? The Human Development Index. And the World Bank uh, Human Development Index, again, the most important things are the issues around social determinants of disease and what drives infection burden. So access to clean water, sanitation, vaccination programs, and infrastructure. So our, uh, the, in the global South, our, our actual um, focus shouldn't be just on producing new antibiotic um, or new antimicrobials, but on actually tackling the social determinants of infection. And if you look at the funding portfolio for, um, for uh, work in AMR, it is hugely biased towards research and development of anti new antimicrobials. Indeed, 10.5 billion US dollars have been invested in, in R&D, and the majority have been in antimicrobials. You can see that a relatively small amount on diagnostics and vaccines, but the vaccines in particular uh, would be incredibly beneficial to the low middle income countries. Furthermore, those that procure all the antibiotics are not those where in the majority the pollution is occurring because India and China are largest producers of antibiotics and then the, the, the um, uh, routes to uh, the, the global north occur. But if you look, go to the swim in Hyderabad in this lake where so much antimicrobial antibiotic um, production occurs, this is where the greatest pollution. So again, on an environmental One Health issue, although the major consumers are, are in the global north, the major environmental hazards perhaps are in the global south. So what do we need? We need to prioritize reducing infection burden and the implementation science that require, that helps us to achieve that. And of course, these are you know, extreme examples. So the fantastic fl flushable toilet in Japan and the most expensive water in the world. But when you've got millions still have openly defecating um, in low middle income countries, uh, giving unsafe sanitation and our children and our, ourselves having to drink in many countries unsafe water, unclean water, that is where I would say for the global south our priorities lie. Similarly, immunization, both in as a One Health measure, both in food production systems and in human health, plays a critical role. We should be doing a lot more research and particularly now during COVID, where we've seen this terrible um, vaccine hesitancy and, and the sort of decimation of trust in science and vaccination, we need an awful lot more research into the social sciences around vaccine uptake and indeed the social sciences around AMR in general, which we haven't really heard much about yet this morning. So immunization could really transform the reduction in antibiotic use for a pneumos, uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine can dramatically reduce potential antibiotic days, 11.4 million antibiotic days per year reduction if you had universal uh, PCV um, uptake. Influenza vaccination we saw in Ontario when they moved from targeted to a whole of population, a reduction in antibiotic use. And there's multiple um, lines of evidence in terms of uh, vaccination in the animal food production systems. This one in Norway in the salmon farming redu reduction, the immunization reduced antibiotic use um, dramatically. So there are very good examples where research and implementation of vaccination programs could benefit the Global South far more uh, than uh, a new antibiotic ever would. Furthermore, we need investment in research and investment in implementation of the change that's going to be required 
to reduce antibiotic use in food production systems. And that plays into food security. While you've got in low middle income countries, absolutely packed poultry um, production systems and cattle uh, production and indeed in all herds, in high income countries where you're able to space out the chickens, de-stress them, have them better environments. And this was a farm I visited in, in the Netherlands where the cows, you know, they, they didn't, hadn't used antibiotics in two years because of the of the um, implementation that they had put into reducing uh, antibiotic use because of increased infection prevention by safety biosecurity. So that's where the global south needs its interventions. The projected global shortage in healthcare workers, and we know this uh, again, predominantly falls in Africa and low middle income countries. There is a massive shortage. And unless we understand how, what sort of research, what sort of models of new models of healthcare professionals, physician assistants, increasing nursing, pharmacists, um, et cetera, that's important in human health, but also in veterinary health. A reduction and shortage in the number of veterinarians plays a major role in the global state of food security from 2020. This is the area again in yellow in Africa where we've got a problem. And we have a massive reduction uh, shortage of veterinarians who play critical roles in the food chain and production chain, including their potential oversight on antibiotics. And again, we have within countries this critical issue of the social determinants of health in countries with very high Gini coefficients. And I think South Africa still has the highest Gini coefficient. In other words, the gap between the rich and the poor. So I'm going to, going to end up asking the question, well, should we be sweating? That, and this is slightly flippant. I appreciate it's just to sort of stimulate the mind. Should we be sweating the small stuff? And of course, it's not small stuff when the AMR, AMR pandemic is a much, uh, is a much more uh, problematic and global issue. And I'm here now linking this, the issue of AMR to um, the pathogenic diseases aggravated by climate change. And you can see all of these different effects of climate change, warming, rains, floods, droughts, et cetera, all play a role in the transmission and increase in burdens of disease. And you can see here that a variety of different um, pathogens, including a large amount of bacteria, are affected by climate change. And indeed, you know, of the 277 pathogenic diseases aggravated by climate change, over half are known to have impacted on human health already. And you can see I've underlined various bacterial pathogens, such as Vibrio cholera and others, which are very amenable to picking up antibiotic resistance genes, and particularly typhoid. Now, you know that in Pakistan, there's a H58 clay of ty salmonella typhi, which is now resistant to, to everything but azithromycin and the carbapenems. Well, they, watch this space, because I think we're about to see um, a strain that is actually resistant to everything. And with mass drug administration of azithromycin through Africa, this threatens the treatment of typhoid. So do we need more implementation research and research around uh, what we're gonna do around climate change and AMR? And antibiotic resistance does increase with local temperatures. John Brownstein's group in Boston, so this very nice paper I mean, Nature Climate Change a few years ago, showing the relationship with increasing temperature and antibiotic resistance genes. So this is big picture problems. And the other thing, and not just about climate change, but what drives climate change is, of course, our destruction of ecosystems and the environment. And that increases the spillover events. And we know this through SARS, the COVID-2 and other um, spillover viruses, Hendra and uh, Rio viruses, um, and MERS and others. But we're also, just to point out and make the parallel um, connection with AMR, is that a lot of what we're doing is actually a destruction of our own environment, our internal body environment, which is the microbiota. And in destroying the microbiota with unnecessary antibiotic use, we are destroying the, um, the microbiota, we're destroying our normal bacteria and we're increasing spillover events and with horizontal gene transfer we are potentially breeding um, very unpleasant pan resistant infections in what is up to now relatively um, unhindered uh, pathogens in terms of resistance such as uh, vibrio cholera a one health approach to amr so in the end have we got it right are our priorities right i would say yes and no 
we've got a real major problem in global uh, funding streams into R and D, and uh, and we each of our three speakers has discussed funding, and I think we could um, discuss this further as we go. But bang for buck, the eighty three percent of the world's population in low in middle income country and low income countries do not come from the research and development of a new antimicrobial or a number of new antimicrobials. It comes from reversing social determinants of disease. Where will the necessary funding come from to reverse the inequity? Well, there's been an editorial um, in Lancet's um, Global Health on the potential for repurposing the global um, fund. Uh, the existing burden of AMR and future threats should be an urgent stimulation uh, to revise and widen the global funds um, funding mission. And I would uh, endorse, certainly endorse that. So to get perfect balance, if we're to reach our goal of mitigating the AMR pandemic in a more equitable balance, we must meet the needs of the global South and not just the global North. And in saying that, I'm cognizant and in ending, I am cognizant, I'm not trying to say to you that the production of new antimicrobials is not important. C clearly it's critical and it will benefit the global South in time. But if you think about the sort of antibiotics that are being generated, they are extremely they're antibiotics that are used in extremely small percentages of the population with very resistant bugs. That is not the answer to mitigating antimicrobial resistance. When I think hope that when you're thinking about your implementation research and where we should be putting our money, you will think about this potential for the global south to change the picture. Thanks very much. Okay, so I'd like to um, I'd like to have a, rope, a mic, please. So I'm going to sit down. I'd like to invite invite our speakers to join me at the front, please. Okay, so this um, this uh, session is open for questions, um, and maybe we could uh, we could open questions if you have them. Please do uh, ask. Um, I'll use uh, the time that you're waiting to ask the questions just to come back to this question about funding. So each of you really talked about funding. I mean, Ronnie, you talked about local research, local solutions and local ownership. Um, and there, that brings up the question about local funding. A lot of funding for AMR research and implementation research still runs through very high income country, global north institutions, um, not just uh, philanthropies, but universities with subcontracts. Is that the right thing to do, Tine? Again, funding, how should the funding flow? JPIMR, you talked about um, funding for implementation research being within local partnership. That's great. And countries playing more of a role. So maybe each of you could just very briefly touch on this, what your thoughts are about how we increase funding. Okay, so I, I think one of the first gaps is, I mean, we've seen with the Global Fund, they've put a lot of money on implementation research. But if you put the funds and you don't have the absorptive capacity in country, that fund is not used. And, and this has been a clear issue. So one of the key issues is to ensure that you build a critical mass of researchers within countries so that they can lead uh, research, they can set their own priorities, local research, local solutions, and they also have the capacity to absorb um, those funding. If the research funding and the researchers who have capacity are all from the global north, then they have the power of decisions also on the kind of research that can happen. So um, Mark spoke of this balance, and I think we need that balance. Uh, we're not saying that, uh, um, I mean, uh, that the North should not be involved. So, no, we absolutely need global solidarity, but there must be a balance on that. And I think the decisions for implementation research should come from the ground for priorities on the ground. And uh, if certain research cannot be handled by frontline researchers or in the country, bring in the additional academia, bring in others uh, through partnerships to actually answer those implementation research questions. And I think most countries also don't recognize the importance of operational research. And if you have tuberculosis or HIV or AMR program, it is very difficult to find an AMR budget line. 
in in their budgeting. And and if if there's a cut in funding, uh, the one that takes the the the, the slash is often M monitoring and evaluation and operational research. So I think there's need to integrate operational research within the system so that and then also build the capacity at the same time so that people recognize the importance of research uh, and it must become part of the institutional culture of using research to address to address and find solutions to constraints and make a difference. Uh, I think that's what I can say. I just following on that, I think it's very important we were really trying to do is to integrate those countries in the funding. As you're saying, you know, all the funders comes from the global north. So of course, when we are talking about prioritization, is their own funding, you know? So it, then it's it's difficult because of course they are going to address what they think is their needs. And therefore I always advocate for countries like for example, South Africa, come to this call, even you put very little money, it's not, it's of course, Germany or UK is going to put many, many millions and then you can put, but even you just put little bit, little, little, little bit, you're going to be sitting in the table with the other funders. So your voice will be the same. So it will be equal grounds then. Your voice, even though you're putting very little, will be the same as Germany or UK. So it is important that uh, the governments and the ministries of research and health understand that they need to participate even though with very little funding in order to really be able to drive the research priorities that at the end we're going to be funding. So this integration, it is important. And um, so it is about working then is very much we're saying also on, on, on the ground to understand also the needs on the ground that in the funding level, which is very policy and political might not be well understood. Yeah, thank you. I couldn't agree more with than with Ronnie and, and Laura. I, I think one of the key challenges for AMR is that it's called AMR. It is untreatable infections. And I think if if people realize that it's people dying and it's untreatable infections, it would be easier to communicate the value of the investment. Uh, I mean, we see this huge investment in TB, in malaria. It's one disease, it's one treatment, it's one... It's an easy one, but but I think there's really we need to work on the narrative and just make sure that the the funder or whoever is communicated with understands the actual impact and that it's here with you right now. I think that's really important. Um, and then the other thing, I, building on what Ronnie said, I think it's extremely important to have local capacity and also to systematically capture the good practices, the good wins. I think the example I gave, there were 13 studies out of more than 1,500 that met the inclusion criteria that was following up on outcomes. Make it a systematic, every time there's a project, capture the learnings, do some implementation or operational research component always, because that will help build the case for investment moving forward. And then lastly, I can I can recommend to contact <laughs> ICAS, which is a new new institution that's working on co-creations from the from country level on on implementation research projects. It's a small entity, but it's it's one of the new players. Thank you. I think that's a very good point. Um, but I just to say to one one thing to point out, of course, is that the lack of implementation um, antimicrobial stewardship implementation publications does not mean that there is a lack of antimicrobial stewardship implementation in countries. But the fact that it's not published is a problem. So maybe we need more funding to support publication as well, which sometimes is a barrier. But uh, we're going to open it up. I think we have um, we have a, so a gentleman here and then a gentleman on the stairs. And then a lady there with a lovely scarf and our colleague behind her. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Robert from the uh, University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana. Uh, I must say a big thanks to the uh, speakers, because all the presentations were thought-provoking, very interesting uh, things to learn. My question uh, would go to almost uh, all of you. The idea of global health decolonization, what do you think of it uh, in the context of IR? Why do I say that uh, we're talking about funding gaps here and there? We'd all agree that um, in the global uh, south, funding is a big issue. 
and research is driven largely by the North, yet we want to decolonize. How is that possible? If the agenda is still set by the global North and then the South is just to run with it. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to take that first? Dora. No, I just following up of what we're saying, I think it's very important that people is on the table on equal grounds. That is very important. And in order to, to do so, you know, people need to bring something on the table. And I think this is a, a massive step on that. And also now where you can see all the consultations regarding future research priorities are trying to be, I think COVID has helped us very much on this to be much more open and not to have these closed committees and closed people deciding, but trying to be much more open and much more online that everyone can provide a feedback into it. But also by having the countries, all the countries on the table, because at the end it's going to be a votation, at the end there's rankings, at the end someone is voting. So that's what is important to really get into international networks, really be present, really be active out there, you know? That is like, that I think it's important is that I can contribute. I, thank you, Robert. But I, I think the ball is also in our own court, uh, low and middle income countries. And I think today there will be uh, sessions on research prioritization. I think countries must be actively involved with the research prioritization process. And once that is done, look at models like what we've presented, build implementation research capacity uh, and move the agenda forward. And a lot of implementation research does not need a lot of funding. If you want to look at, uh, as Mark has said, stewardship and inf infection prevention control, uh, a lot of the checklists are there from WHO. All we have to really do is to move forward uh, and try to have that integrated within the system. And you will hear from our colleagues later of how implementation research has capacity has been built in, in countries um, and in their institutions through this process. So please be positive, be encouraged, uh, and take on implementation research. Thank you. That was a, a very interesting question. I think we can go further into that in discussion. So I have gentlemen here, and then I have um, our friend with the beautiful purple scarf, and then the lady in black. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, all the speakers. Very good presentations, very informative. Tina, you started by saying your presentation was theoretical. I think it was very factual. And if we look at the AMR problem and its complexity, and the need to integrate AMR within already existing vertical programs like TB, malaria, HIV, AIDS, et cetera. Is it fair to say that there is a need to strengthen health system? There is a need for good governance and leadership, need policies, guidelines, and we need research for that. At least from health system, health perspective, uh, there is a need for health financing, there is a need for health workforce, micropologists, other disciplines that's needed, capacity building. Uh, there is a need for infrastructure, laboratories, health facilities. There is a need for information and communication, data. And there is a need to improve the health service delivery, prescribing practice, simple things like requesting for culture. So can tackling AMR provide an opportunity to strengthen the health system, build the resilience, particularly in light of the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. And marks, that also will help, I think, the global south. And given the fact that not only the global south was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the north. So this can be an opportunity to align priorities between the north and the south. Thank you. Yeah, it, well, thank you. I couldn't agree more that it's an opportunity to, to strengthen health services. And I guess we need to move away from seeing investing in health as a cost to investing in health as, as, a, as an investment for the society of, of welfare and, and building, you know, fighting the social determinants for health um, in the positive way. Maybe I'll leave it to Mark. Yeah. No, thank you. I mean, just to point to, to make it's an, an interesting observation, though, that towards a health system's resilience, the, the, the fundamental to that is, is universal health coverage, which requires the strengthening and focus on primary health care 
And what's so interesting in AMR is so much of the implementation, so much of the work is done in the health institution setting, not in primary health care. And I think a lot of the implementation research that we should be funding is actually in the community to build health systems resilience. So I certainly take your point. Um, our lady, lady there, um, I'm coming to, yes, there's a mics behind you, then the lady in the black, and then our colleague in front. So I'm Dr. Rizwana from uh, ICDDRB, Bangladesh. So uh, uh, I have been working uh, 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 on AMR since uh, 2016, uh, 2017. So uh, uh, that was a epidemiological study uh, relation with uh, food hygiene and uh, antimicrobial resistance. And uh, another one is uh, was a special temporal relationship between uh, um, environment and AMR. So, uh, so my question is for Mark. Uh, so you said. Uh, antibiotic resistance increases by increasing local temperature. So actually, uh, it's a new sentence or new word for me. Uh, can you or would you please uh, uh, describe or any uh, new uh, situation uh, that I am hearing? So thank you. I mean, uh, very briefly, um, um, I mean, the, the example I was giving, it, it was a publication um, in Nature Climate Change, which showed, which looked at the United States and looked at the temperature um, relationship to um, to E. coli resistance for a number of antibiotics. And that very nice um, sort of direct proportion graph was for amoxicillin resistance in E. coli as you went across in, from the um, colder climates down into Florida and the, the South, where it was warmer, that's just one. That's just one example. I think there are, there are other examples that, and it was to make the point that climate change is impacting um, not only on spillover events and the, the chance of transmission, but also actually on resistance. I don't. If you ask me, is it the main player in driving antibiotic resistance? No. But it was to try and um, ex exemplify that climate change does impact on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, a, a colleague behind you, if you could pass back. Thank you. Thank you very much to the speakers. My name is Eleanor Magongo. I'm a pediatrician. I work with the Ministry of Health in Uganda, and I lead our national program for children and adolescents living with HIV. And I'm also part of the WHO HIV DR steering committee. And there are discussions about merging the AMR team and the HIV DR team. So this is a growing area of interest for me. And my question goes to our mainly Ronnie. I have you done any implementation research projects working with ministries of health, in particular the national drug authorities, to ensure that uh, the regulation. Uh, in terms of prescription is checked because I think in the low and middle income countries, the biggest problem that is fueling AMR is the fact that anyone can walk into a, a pharmacy and ask for any drug and they will get it. Yeah. I attended the IAS meeting in Paris and I got this scope. I went to a pharmacy and asked for Amoxil and I couldn't get it. But in Uganda and many other income countries, anybody, a person can go to a pharmacy and they'll get any antibiotic they want. So I, I think that the biggest challenge that needs to be addressed is to ensure that the regulation around prescription is checked. When we do that, then the other interventions like capacity building and all the things that we've been sharing will now come into place. So are there any projects that you're doing with regulators to address this problem. Thank you. Okay, so let me just start by saying that in all the countries, including Uganda, we work very closely with the ministries of health. And in fact, our research program is embedded uh, and complements the national action plans uh, for antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and we work also through the WHO country offices. So all the studies that are presented and sorted are 
uh, country research priorities. And actually, Uganda is one of our target countries. And it's one of the countries where we have actually looked at that within the health system. So I would recommend, uh, we've done this consumptions, we've done prescription behaviors uh, led by national researchers. Please look at the links I have in that presentation, which you would have online, and you will find several studies on this. Uh, but going back into that uh, uh, point that you've men me mentioned, there is a delicate balance between access and excess. Uh, and if the health system fails to provide antibiotics, putting in the regulations you know will not work and it will be overcome. So, uh, and of course, community behavior is, is a very important concept around this. And I think Mark touched that very well, the social determinants around it. We can put the regulations, but if you do not make those antibiotics available to people who need uh, the antibiotics, they will find other ways of finding it. Thank you. Even in South Africa, where if you'd asked me five years ago whether antibiotics are available over the counter, I would have said no. But a study recently has shown that in community pharmacies using actors, it was quite easy to get an antibiotic in certain pharmacies, not the big chains. So I think your point is very well taken. Uh, we have a question from uh, our colleague, speaker. Thank you so much for the presentations. Um, my question goes to Laura. Um, I'm from the animal side, so I'm a vet, so I'll focus on the animal side. Um, when you were presenting, my first question should have been, if you are working in West Africa, I saw some West Africa countries. So the other question would be now, are you looking at the animal side of it, like supporting the institution that are working with the Minister of Livestock, or Minister of Agriculture? Um, I did not see any West Africa, like Sierra Leone, Liberia, and others. Are you intent, I mean, the intention are you extending to these uh, places? Um, my other question goes to Mark. Um, thank you for the presentations. Um, now that we all know um, the challenges we are faced with AMR, and we know that if the animal aspect is not taken care of, the human obviously will not solve their problem because 80% of these zoonoses are from animals and we keep using antibiotic to grow the chicks or other animals. So um, what can we put in place now to address the gap in the Senate? Because not only South Africa, I don't know for South Africa, but in my country, there are only three vets for the whole country. Yes, so. <laughs> yes, so what can we do? to address the gap, thank you. No, thank you, thank you for this question. And he's like, you know, you know, we, we need to, to, to break the silos, you know, in this IMR mentality. Where it happens, for example, in Europe, all the funders of animal health, you know, and, and it's about discussing with them and reaching them out and bringing them now to the IMR field because they have not been as a, as a major concern, resistance in their mind in the last years and they have been uh, animal health is very much European focus so they only found very much in Europe and so forth so now it's really for the new program we are building is really to bring these people on board who traditionally don't fund in, in lower middle income settings which traditionally I don't think that resistance animal is such a big thing so basically now what we are trying is to bring these new funders on board to change this mentality and to make them understand that this is an international problem and therefore we they need to reach out outside with their funding so this is something that we are going to be working more in the future we are working on that to try to have more funding on that so I'd like to, I mean, we could talk about that all day, and I'd like to ask a, a one question, last question to our panel. I mean, I'm going to throw the cat amongst the pigeons now and say, um, undoubtedly, the, the transfer, potential transfer of resistant bacteria through the animal food chain and the environment and everything is, is uh, correct and important. Is it the priority in mitigating antibiotic resistance? That's the discussion we need to do have. And, you know, it, it, everybody agrees in this room, everybody globally agrees one health, this is a one health problem. But again, when you're talking about prioritization of interventions and funding, you've got a real problem here and you've got to under, got to actually in the end, put your bang where your buck is. I'll get your bang for your buck, which brings me to the last question. I'm gonna give each of you $1 billion where would you put 
your intervention and implementation for anti for mitigating antimicrobial resistance globally? Think about it, you know. It's it's yeah. The key priority. This is um, it's so difficult to me. It's very difficult. Difficult. I just come from a meeting talking about these billions that we need for a new antimicrobial, and I agree with you, Mark. This is not the top priority for me. And I say that even though we put a lot of funding in the discovery of new antimicrobials. Unfortunately, that's what most people believe in the world. Most people in the world, this is the top priority is to create a new antimicrobial. And we are putting most of all our resources in there. And I personally believe this is not the way to go. So really we need to re we need to convince people basically to move away from that. So I'm gonna give you a hundred dollars for that answer. And I'm going to bank the uh, the rest. <laughs> okay, so a little bit along the same lines. Now, I think I think we need to look very carefully at the whole transmission chain and mitigate infection, bring down infection rates everywhere, because that would really make a difference. I would invest personally in optimizing vaccine programs. I don't think any country in the world optimizes the use of vaccines, not in the global north, nor in the global south. I think there's a lot to win on that. And secondly, I would really focus on the WASH initiatives, bringing down, again, infections in the community, bringing down altogether the, the infection rate. So I think that's that's where I would, uh, I would look at in interventions that we know work and try to roll them out more globally. So, so Mark, you said I got the one billion, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if I had the one billion, I'll put the 500 million in prevention in each of the sectors, animal, human, and environment, because that will give me the greatest bang for the buck. The 250 million I would put in health system strengthening because AMR is a transversal issue. And for the other 250 million, maybe we should discuss a coffee. <laughs> Okay, so I don't give up my billions very li very lightly. So I think 100, 100, I think, Ronnie, you can have a little bit more. It's terrible being put on the spot, and I apologize. And obviously, you know, they've got very good ideas um, of how to do that. One thing that really has, uh, that I haven't heard enough about is behavioral research and social sciences research. I mean, goodness, we've been through COVID. We've seen, however, when you talk about optimizing vaccination programs, I mean, the key optimization is you can, again, have as many beautiful toys as you want. If you can't actually use them, it doesn't matter. You know, so where is the behavioral research, the implementation? And I would, again, you know, passionately suggest that anything you decide to do, um, any intervention in AMR from whatever field that you are actually uh, focusing also on how you actually use behavior change and the social sciences to get into that. I think we've had an incredibly rich discussion. We've had three fantastic presentations. Thank you. And now just, uh, I think if there's housekeeping, I'm going to hand over and wish you a very, very wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, apologies for the teething problems um, at the start, but I think we really picked up steam and it was just such an amazing session. And thank you, Mark. You Amazing. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly, yes, we've got tea now for half an hour, um, so we'll be rounding everybody up in 25 minutes. Um, the speakers for the next session could probably come in a bit early as well. Um, but I also wanted to mention we've got some lightning presentations, these video short uh, three minute uh, presentations, which were selected. It was an open call for applications through the AMR hub and um, these one, two, three, four, seven awesome uh, 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 videos that were um, selected and were support the the um, presenters were supported to come to the symposium. Um, so I just wanted to mention, if you're in the room, unless you're too shy, maybe you could just stand up and we could <laughs> putting you on the spot. So it's Yusuf um, Babatunde, Julian Nima Pachitu, Zoraya Chidwadza, Yen Ti Hong, Helen Mangochi, Walter Agingu, and Larissa Bolton. Very well done.
only one person stood up. Oh no, there was. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Um, so we'll be playing those sporadically through the day. Uh, we don't want to eat into your coffee break um, too much. So um, maybe we could do one now. Um, but otherwise, just before the lunch break, uh, we'll do a few more. So please do watch them. Thank you very much. Antimicrobial resistance is the silent pandemic and estimated to cause 10 million deaths by 2050. Inappropriate use of antibiotics in communities, for example, for managing acute respiratory infections, has been reported widely as a cause of antibiotic resistance. Intervention tackling antibiotic resistance often targeted individual behavior change, but the interventions were often unsuccessful in many contexts as they failed to address root causes of the issues. Therefore, understanding context of antibiotic use will better inform interventions addressing the misuse and overuse of antibiotics in communities. The WHO has warned Vietnam for its growing threat of antibiotics resistance due to inappropriate use of antibiotics in the healthcare system, farming, food production, and community. With an attempt to tackle the problem, we conducted a qualitative study by interviewing 15 female participants from 22 to 62 years old, and participants observed in the community's performance. We also asked the participants to sort out a variety of medications that we brought into the interviews. We focused on talking to women as we as they were men, the main caregivers in the family. We explored the healthcare seeking practices and perceptions of medicines and antibiotic use. The study was done in three districts in Nam Dinh province, north of Vietnam. As knowledge about antibiotics and antibiotics resistance was low in the communities, antibiotics use with the prescription was popular. In this study, we argue that the, the use of medicines and antibiotics in the communities are shaped by social cultural factors and uh, in the, the inefficient healthcare system in rural Vietnam. We use the term dilemmas of care to illustrate the situation when the study participants want to use antibiotics appropriately, they still face systematic challenges, such as doctors prescribing antibiotics inappropriately in state healthcare facilities, pressure from the wider community for being a good model by giving medicines to their sick children, and the financial concerns taking for taking leave, sick leave, or paying extra in costs in hospitals. These dilemmas of care challenged efforts to change antibiotic use in rural communities. To do so requires a much more strategic plan to improve the situation than just behavioral change strategies focusing on individual knowledge and attitudes. These include changing doctor prescription practices and a more strict antibiotic stewardship programs, reducing barriers to healthcare access, and to trusted information changing community cultural norms about the meaning of bodily love and reducing poverty. All right, we'd like to welcome everyone of us back from the tea break and we want to believe we had a very interesting session this morning, ably led by uh, Mark. We are gonna start in earnest, but we'd like to start with another lightning presentation number two so we'd like everybody to please listen to uh our abstract author as uh, he or she is going to uh, make another presentation on a very interesting subject matter the technical team from the back will help get this presentation up on the screen as we all listen attentively Welcome everyone to the Antimicrobial Resistance Symposium. My name is Larie and I will be telling you more about the antibiotics for neonatal sepsis in Africa, or ANTISIP. On behalf of our team, I will be presenting an outline of how we plan to derive antibiotic recommendations for neonatal sepsis using techniques from data science. The general lack of population level neonatal sepsis data hinders the development of antibiotic recommendations for neonatal sepsis in Africa, where about 250,000 African neonates die from severe bacterial infections annually. 
Antibiotic resistance rates in Sub-Saharan Africa are high and access to effective antibiotic therapy for neonatal sepsis is limited. Even if appropriate therapy is available, the occurrence of antimicrobial resistance could result in an increase in mortality. The ANSA study aims to use the available Sub-Saharan African neonatal bloodstream infection datasets to determine the optimal empiric antibiotic choice for severe bacterial infection in neonates. We plan to address this by generating empiric antibiotic coverage estimates for neonatal sepsis using weighted incidence syndromic antibiograms, or WISCA. The estimates are stratified by neonatal unit type, regional or national, and geographical region, national or multinational. Multinational analysis will include South Africa, Malawi, Botswana, and Ghana. The utility of this method for evaluating the appropriateness of existing empiric antibiotic recommendations was justified by analysis of a regional South African dataset containing 136 early onset and 485 healthcare associated sepsis episodes at nine neonatal units in the Western Cape in South Africa, including central, regional and district hospitals between 2017 and 2018. For this regional dataset, the mean estimated antibiotic coverage of ampicillin plus gentamicin for early onset neonatal sepsis ranged from 55% for tertiary hospitals to 84% for non-tertiary hospitals. Comparatively, antibiotic coverage for healthcare associated neonatal sepsis ranged from 67 to 80% for piperacillin tazobactam plus amikacin and 60 to 77% for meropenem at tertiary and non-tertiary hospitals, respectively. The regional South African dataset highlights the need for annual review of empiric antibiotics in light of increasing antibiotic resistance rates. Applying novel quantitative approaches, such as the WISCA, to multinational datasets will enable targeted empiric antibiotic therapy to be aligned with drug susceptibility in real time, ultimately improving patient outcomes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, um, on to the um, session before lunch. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Rob Terry, who's going to chair this session. He's the manager. It's in, all in your, <laughs> your program, but um, briefly, manager of research policy at WHO TDR, responsible for knowledge management, open access, data sharing, and ensuring evidence is translated into policy and practice. Over 25 years experience in strategy development and implementation, he was senior policy advisor at Wellcome, leading development of its first open access policy and establishment of Europe PubMed Central. He's worked in several positions at WHO, has served as a consultant for charities and international development agencies and groups. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz. So what we now have is six uh, presentations, five in the room and one online, uh, talking about real world situations and uh, in many of the examples actually the application of operational research and implementation research and as we've heard how important that is uh, if we're actually going to manage, monitor, survey uh, and try to get a grip uh, on antimicrobial resistance in different environments and you know this is a One Health focus in this conference so we will certainly from the researchers that we've supported in TDR, we'll be hearing from uh, veterinary sciences, as you've heard, uh, from human health uh, and environment as well. So I think, uh, as has been said before, the pamphlet is excellent in terms of uh, recording the, the short bios of the speakers. So I'll, I'll point you to uh, the, the pamphlet for that. But our first speaker will be uh, Merklin Mpundu uh, from the REACT Africa group. Uh, um, based in Zambia. So, Merkin, please. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. I'll try to give some reflections on, on the One Health policy implementation, the lessons that uh, we have learned as we have uh, been working in different countries. Um, the One Health uh, uh, concept became mostly popularized uh, 
really after the passage of the Global Action Plan, that has got five strategic goals. And um, this was uh, uh, something that was supported uh, uh, by the tripartite and they endorsed at the World Health Assembly in, um, and so a number of countries have developed uh, all these colorful plans that they call One Health. And uh, they were launched mostly in many countries by the Minister of Health and the ministry, uh, ministers of agriculture and veterinary sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, so you notice that a number of these cross-cutting areas are uh, improving awareness and knowledge, strengthening knowledge, uh, a reduction in infection, optimization of antimicrobials, and also developing an economic case are uh, all actually cross-cutting in the human and animal sector. There are many definitions of One Health, and uh, it's one concept that is not, uh, that's very confusing uh, to many and not very clear. Uh, One Health is an integrated um, unifying approach that aims to really sustainably uh, balance and optimize health uh, of humans, animals, plants, and ecosystem. It recognizes the health of humans, uh, domestic and wild animals, plants, and the wider environment are closely linked and interdependent. That, you know, we live in one space. And AMR is a cross cutting issue that affects uh, each and every sector. So it only makes sense that, uh, you know, there are a number of diseases that move in these environments and, you know, uh, especially pathogens. And um, so they, it makes sense to try and address really one um, AMR using this approach. It mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities at varying levels of society to actually work together to foster well-being and tackle threats to health and ecosystems uh, while addressing the collective need for clean water, energy, air, um, safe, and uh, nutritious food, and also taking action on climate change, as we saw earlier in the presentation. One Health really promotes the goal it's a, um, to get a sustainable and healthy future through collaborations. And so it brings together a number of sectors and disciplines that are going to uh, work, and it needs coordination, capacity building, and communication. So what have been the challenges uh, in terms of implementation of One Health uh, uh, national action plans uh, in this way? Uh, really, firstly, is that uh, it is quite a different way of working. Uh, ministries of health, agriculture, education, they are used to working in silos. And so in most countries, the technical institution and professional barriers actually abound. Sustainability concerns, competing priorities, and funding deficiencies uh, don't support a One Health approach in interventions. The One Health concept has evolved by broadening its scope. However, we noticed that the environmental sector and the environmental uh, um, uh, they are not yet, uh, they've not been taken up and their considerations of what uh, we need to actually look in the environment is not incorporated when implementing this national action plan. Uh, research, uh, there are also socioeconomic factors in, um, in the management of disease and also emergence, but also the cost and benefits. Some other challenges is that the environmental sector, which consists of areas really such as, I mean, natural resources management, wildlife management and conservation, uh, biodiversity conservation, management and sustainable use, including pollution. These are not always routinely incorporated in One Health approaches at country level, and there has been limited engagement in cross, uh, um, in working together across the sectors and the initiatives that we can work together on. The role of the environment and the, and the determinants of health has not been well understood by other actors, and there is good potential to integrate environmental cons um, considerations more, uh, uh, more consistently. Uh, some of the other challenges are that, you know, professions, we don't work together. We are segregated. We work in silos, and then really inadequate, inadequate representation of sectors in planning meetings, in NAP implementation, uh, then also uh, 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 disjointed legislative schemes, uh, a lack of data sharing and transparency and siloed budgets because each sector really budgets for its own. One minister will say, you know, my mandate is in the Minister of Agriculture. They will not work with the Minister of Health in terms of uh, uh, those activities in the national plan that allows 
that, uh, um, that collaboration or that needs the collaboration. Um, some of the other experiences are that, you know, the greatest challenge, of course, is really moving from a really paper to action in terms of national action plan. Uh, beyond funding really challenges, a major bottleneck is human resources. And I think Mark uh, um, talked about that quite a bit, infrastructure and data. Again, the EMA, uh, the focal points that run the National Secretariat for implementation of NAPS under, under this One Health umbrella, they've got other primary jobs and NAP implementation is very little on their, uh, uh, on their really uh, uh, job portfolio. Then of course, uh, data is not available and really prioritizing when you don't have data, you don't have funds becomes a big, big major issue. The One Health um, a really approach we have learned, it requires interdisciplinary uh, uh, collaboration really across the key stakeholders involved in healthcare delivery uh, in food systems and the environment. It also means that we've got to address uh, some of the drivers of really AMR and you know, uh, those are really indiscriminate uh, uh, use of antibiotics especially and uh, because we can access them in most countries without a prescription. Um, and up to 80% of antibiotics that we consume in humans, uh, they are actually excreted into the waste stream and uh, you know, uh, uh, they get into the environment and polluted, but also, also the influencer uh, that come out of the pharmaceutical industries. And of course, uh, we, we've got 600 million people, I mean, globally uh, with uh, uh, no access to clean water. That becomes a challenge. And one, uh, uh, one in eight people defecate in open spaces. Uh, and so if the 80% gets into the environment, it gets into our water. Uh, uh, management. What do we want to see? Yeah, I would like to see that uh, NAP, uh, NAP implementations in low and middle income countries are actually accelerated with um, a very clear model of systemic monitoring of the progress and ensuring that there is actually uh, and there is actually uh, uh, um, the continuation and sustainability of efforts. There is an increased uptake of different AMS models and with greater involvement of healthcare workers, we hope to see that implementation of NAPS are going, to, are going to move forward. It's been five years with very little progress, especially in the African region. Uh, we need to involve communities and local governments and global actors to develop and scale up innovative projects, but also really increase the collaboration and talking about how we can work together on issues that are cross cutting. Uh, one health approach, uh, really, uh, we need to be able to conduct uh, public awareness campaigns to actually educate our society about the harm that is caused by overuse and misuse of, um, of antimicrobials. And then, of course, I mean, the unnecessary uh, use in the animal sector, agriculture as growth promoters. We need to prevent infections by improving, by improving actually hygiene and also provision of clean and safe water. Uh, we need to uh, get good global surveillance and promote new uh, rapid uh, clinical diagnosis. Again, promoting uh, vaccines on the prevention side, that would be very effective. Uh, we need to uh, be able to work with a number of people and increase expertise in infectious diseases, in global innovation and early stage research, but also in creating incentives that promote uh, uh, this investment uh, in new drugs and vaccines and build a global coalition. Uh, the Quadrapatite has just released really a six point, I mean, action plan uh, that focuses on enhancing One Health capacities to actually strengthen health system, uh, reduction of risks and controlling, eliminating uh, zoonotic and neglected tropical and vector um, bone the diseases and also strengthening uh, the health system and management and communication and keeping um, the silent epidemics. I will not go through this, but uh, really what they've done is uh, uh, they've given action points on each one of these actually strategic uh, uh, areas uh, that will support actually countries to uh, develop and implement successful uh, national action plan. And so a One Health um, uh, response to LIMC needs and with a strong focus on NAP implementation, health system strengthening and community engagement is advanced to minimize 
um, the spread of antibiotic resistance. But we can only do that if we work together and not in silos the way we are currently uh, doing it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Murphy. Don't, don't go too far because uh, there may be questions. Um, I'm under the unusual instruction. I'm normally being told, don't let it overrun, don't let it overrun. Today, I'm under the instruction, don't underrun, because the final speaker can only join at 12.20. So you're going to have to help me here. We've got to hit this mark exactly. So we're going to have a few questions after each speaker. So I don't know if there are any thoughts, reflections, or questions for Murfin, um, if you'd like to raise your hand. And, as, and I think, as was said earlier, if we haven't heard from you before, then just say your name and who you're from. But Sorry, if there's another question, please. Another, there's lots of elephants in the room today, Murfin. Yeah. Uh, one, the big, biggest one in your talk is that so many national action plans remain unfunded to be able to do this. How do you shift that? It's time to name and yeah, shame. Yeah, that's a very yeah. So that's a very difficult question. I think one of the mistakes that we made earlier on, I think in 2015 and 2017, was that uh, when. Uh, 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 when countries uh, started developing those plans, uh, those plans and documents, uh, they sit away from other uh, national policies and priorities. Um, so each ministry actually budgets for its own, um, its own activities. And uh, this national action plan sits in some corner, either Minister of Health or Minister of Agriculture. But in terms of um, the they needed to have been really policy documents that are built into the national strategic framework and plans that way they could receive funding but uh, really as it is now they sit alone we have to change that um uh, we need uh the core ministries uh, or what we are seeing at the quadripartite right, to actually sit together and start and start working together in planning and also really ensuring that uh, uh, each ministry is putting uh, uh, those, those activities in the budget for parliament approval. Otherwise, there will not be any movement. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Murfin. Any other questions? Yes, there's a lady at the back there. In the, right on the back row. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Donna Anyona from Amref Health Africa, based in Nairobi. And mine is more of a reflection. Uh, you talked about uh, one of the challenges being lack of robust regulatory frameworks, legal support, and uh, so on and so forth. And I think um, the, the challenge uh, we have, I think as researchers, is sometimes we don't involve, uh, you know, our legal experts so that they have that kind of understanding so that they can be able to also support in terms of some of these frameworks and so on. So I think uh, as a reflection, if we could have a lot of advocacy and work with uh, all these other sectors so that they understand what you're talking about to, for them to be able to you know, support in the policy and legal frameworks would really be good. I wouldn't agree more. I think the, the uh, my only addition is that uh, there has to be a lot of government uh, really buy-in and pushing the processes because what we have now is really a disconnect between uh, these national secretariats that, uh, uh, that are working on AMR, but the PSAs and ministers do not meet and have conversations on AMR, and that's going to be always a problem if they don't do that. Thank you, Murphy. I think because I'm going to keep us moving on. Like I said, we have uh, six we have six presentations to get through. So um, we heard earlier a talk by my colleague uh, Ronnie Zachariah about uh, the structured operational research training program. Um, it sounded great, but now you're actually going to hear from three of the alumni, uh, three three of the researchers that have actually been through that program. Uh, as we've heard already, we're extremely privileged to have one of the three operating vets from Sierra Leone uh, with us today. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Leno, uh, please come up uh, for your talk. Uh, this is, again, you know, we are looking at One Health here. So here we are looking at the agricultural sector uh, and how do we keep uh, a check on, on the use of antibiotics 
uh, within agricultural animal production, in this case, uh, in Sierra Leone. Leno, over to you, please, sir. Thank you so much, Stuart. Okay, um, thank you, good morning. I'm Dr. Amara Leno, I'm a veterinarian uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Veterinary Services Division in Sierra Leone. Um, I'm going to present today um, the antimicrobial use in livestock in Sierra Leone um, from 2016 to 2019. As we all know, um, antimicrobial are used um, for prevention and treatment of um, animal diseases in my own sector. Um, however, overuse or misuse of this antimicrobial lead to antimicrobial resistance. Therefore, regular recording and reporting of antimicrobial is necessary for evaluating the prescribing practices and informing stewardship programs. In Sierra Leone, since 2012, um, the country through the Ministry of Agriculture Livestock Division were implementing a framework of reporting where we have the community animal health workers at chiefdom level. Chiefdom comprise of like 10 to 20 villages. Um, they were sending reports on weekly basis to the district level, where the district livestock officer compile all the reports and send to national on monthly basis. So this was um, what was ongoing. But however, um, this framework was never, never assessed. So therefore, um, we took the venture to um, through the sorted program to um, do a countrywide assessment where we looked at the reporting frequency and we looked at the data quality, the completeness and concordance. Again, um, we looked at the availability of human resource and infrastructure at the reporting site, which are our districts. It was a cross-sectional study. Uh, where we visited um, the 14 district livestock offices in country for the period of uh, January 2016 to August 2019, where data sources were um, review of district data and sub-district reports. And we looked at, again, the human resource and IT infrastructure at district level. The findings, the, the reporting districts out of 14 districts in country, only three were reporting to national. 99% um, in terms of completeness were incomplete. There were a huge gap of human resource out of 178 that is recommended or needed in country for the surveillance. We only have 72 present at district and national level. Um, no mobility for this staff the 72 or the others, no mobility for them, and no internet connectivity, no computer. So we now know how they were reporting paper base. We communicated these findings through a publication. We published the study in an international peer review journal. But more importantly, we effectively and persuasively communicated the findings to decision makers. Because if we want changes, this decision maker need to take action on what need to be done in country. So this is the uh, publication. As a result of the engagement, the Minister of Livestock in collaboration with the Food and Agriculture Organization in country instituted a countrywide mandatory weekly reports. And they conducted, we conducted training on data collection in all the districts with our staff at district level. And again, provided uh, 32 computers and tablets, including motorbikes to these field staff for data collection. As you can see the pictures up, um, that's the training we conducted using the tablets. And then the down the motorbike where the sample of motorbike we give them. So this motorbike were distributed and then data started coming. One year later, one of my colleagues did a follow-up study of my, um, my own study. So the great improvement, like you can see, 
in terms of district that reports, for me, it was three out of 14, giving us 21%. So after the follow-up study, we had 100%. So now districts are reporting. And again, in terms of completeness, when I was doing my own study, it was 1%, but now we have 88. Uh, we need that 88 again to go to 100. So we'll continue to um, publish or to monitor what is ongoing at district level. So in terms of infrastructure and transportation, we now have computers and internet modem were provided to the district level talk officers and the motorbikes are available um, at all levels where people can go to the field and then collect data and send to national. One of the benefits I personally gained from the sorted program, um, I learned the practical skill of conducting operational research. Um, operational research is not like when you're publishing through sort it, you need to sort it. If not, things will not get right. So I personally developed the skill of mentoring others. Like we were trained at regional level, so we mentor the national team. Um, we build critical um, capacity at national level, encourage our staff um, to publish. And then I publish um, policies relevant on relevant paper, like the one I just um, presented to you. and we um, improve the surveillance on antimicrobial use in the animal and human in our, our country. So from the regional, I am part of the regional research network. And then we also have um, the national research network that we created. So from our own people that um, publish. So out of the capacity, the capacity building, um, 12 research study were published. Thank you. So 12 research uh, study was published. So these are some of the example of um, the publication that were made nationally. Um, for more information, you can look at this journal, International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Um, we have our publication there um, from our country. I think so far, this is what I wanted to show and to say about my country. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Leno. Um, and thanks. We, we have some people joining from Zoom, so okay, sure. hence the microphone uh, issues. Uh, we have time for maybe one question or two. That would be helpful. Yes, yeah, so the lady right at the back there, please, with the red. Yeah, I know. You're getting your steps in today. This is good. Uh, I think you're eyeing your number question. I don't know what you're talking about. Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Alice. I work with Amref International University in Kenya. Uh, mine is just a reflection, and that touches also the previous presenter. The issue of uh, antimicrobial resistance is really a big concern. And I'm asking, how can we leverage on the best practices from the HIV programs that uh, African countries have had, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, have had to deal with? HIV was cross-cutting to all sectors. And we have some of the best practices uh, in bringing together all the ministries to address this concern. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, like I was giving comment to Mark when Mark was presenting. We all know we on the animal side, I don't know for humans. Um, we use anti yeah, <laughs> we use antibiotic on daily basis. Every day, veterinarians is like if you don't find a vet with a bottle of antibiotic in his pocket uh, is not an animal practitioner. So um, to address that for our own country, um, we registered like people who are bringing in because we know the consumption of uh, these poultry, uh, uh, meats and other stuff coming from animal, um, you know, we use as growth promoter as well. So we can minimize the importation, but we can't um, stop the importation or these people uh, which are dealing with um, the import and export of um, these antimicrobials. 
I, we may have to move on, but I, I can see one more question. We'll just take that and then. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm not ignore I'm not ignoring any side. I'm just trying to see the hands. We will have a panel at the end, but I, as we heard earlier, we're, we're trying to hit a precise satellite connection uh, with uh, London at about twenty past twelve. But come back to us in the panel if we could just hear your question now, and then we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Eric Okek. I work with the Uganda Virus Research Institute, but I'm also a PhD student at uh, the Makiri University. My question is to my brother, what's your sustainability plan uh, for this very good intervention? Because I know a government can change and whoever is in authority can change. So what strategy do you have? Um, then second question, you presented more of uh, an aggregate data. So I would be interested to maybe look at the quality of the data, and then maybe testimonies from other person apart from you, maybe a beneficiary or some a farmer somewhere or something. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, for the sustainability in terms of human resource you are talking about, right? Okay, the sustainability, yeah. Um, we all agree that government keep changing, but uh, we are supporting, I mean, FAO is supporting the Ministry of Agriculture. We have a unit in FAO called ECTAD, Emergency Center for Transboundary Animal Diseases. So we keep, uh, they are like WHO in the human side. So they keep supporting us. And we have a project called Redise under the World Bank um, that is still running. And they are also supporting in terms of bike maintenance, um, replacement of tablet like we had some district livestock officer that tablet can be damaged so they do replace um for us so the second question um for te testimony of others um i think if you go through uh this yes if you go through this journal you will have the full document of my own research how the data were, paper-based, even incomplete, how things were. So you can go through and then see what you can find will amaze you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leno. Okay, Joe. <laughs> so as I said, we're, we're gonna move on because we have uh, a number of presentations to get through and then we'll have a panel at the end where we can ask questions. So uh, we're gonna move from the animal health sector to the human health sector. Um, and I would like to uh, welcome Jyoti uh, Acharya uh, from Nepal, uh, and she'll be talking uh, about uh, the use, again, of operational research uh, as a surveillance tool um, for, uh, anti for uh, the stewardship of antimicrobial resistance. So, Jyoti, please. I don't know whether you're the right height for this microphone. I think yes, so. I think so. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jyoti Acharya. I'm a microbiologist by profession and uh, working at the National Public Health Lab of Nepal, and I'm taking care of the antimicrobial resistant surveillance. So here I'm going to present my findings on how the operational research I conducted helped me improve the antimicrobial resistance surveillance system. So this is a study uh, that was published on uh, this uh, data, so for your reference. So AMR surveillance started in Nepal in 1999, and we were very happy that we have been conducting it for 20 years. And uh, the surveillance sites, they report the data primarily to the clinicians and to the patients. And then they send the monthly data to National Public Health Lab on NPHL in short. At NPHL, we look at the quality of the data, we compile it, and then we disseminate the findings nationally to the various stakeholders. And since 2017, we started uh, sharing the data with GLASS, which is a WHO global platform for AMR surveillance data. So why WHO GLASS, which is like global antimicrobial resistance and use surveillance system, because it gives the standardized data collection and monitoring to limit in the end, uh, the spread of antimicrobial resistance. And we report the data on eight priority pathogens that are causing the healthcare uh, associated infection or community acquired infections. And we have to look at all the variables we have to report the age, sex, pathogen, AST, origin, et cetera. And 
while reporting to GLASS, uh, we uh, came to realize that we had some deficiencies in our national AMR surveillance data system. So that was the basis of my uh, operational research with the study objectives of doing that study in a particular province, that is the Bagmati province of Nepal, where we have nine of the surveillance sites. So uh, in the nine surveillance sites, I was supposed to look at the quality of the reported data on its completeness, consistency, and timeliness of receipts at NPHL. And the ones that were not reporting the data regularly, I was looking at the barriers to reporting. So these are the various seven provinces of Nepal and my study only highlighted the Bagmati province because it has the most number of sites. So it was a cross-sectional study over a period of one year from Jan 2019 to January 2020. In the initial part, I looked at the data that was being reported from the five surveillance sites. And in the latter part, I took a structured questionnaire and went to the sites that were not reporting the data regularly to look at what were the barriers. We took the relevant ethical approvals and what did we find? We found that only five out of the nine surveillance sites were reporting regular data to us. And then when we looked at the completeness as compared to the glass variables I talked about, it was highly variable. Sometimes they'll totally miss it and you'll get a 0%. And then other sites that were perfect, uh, we'll have 100%. When we looked at the drug bug combinations, only 66% were complete as per the glass criteria. In the consistency, we looked at the original records at the surveillance site as compared to what they had reported to NPHL. And we saw that there was 13% differences. The delays in reporting would affect us uh, in reporting to the global AMR surveillance system. And the delay was up to 269 days in some sites. So when we looked at the questionnaire and talked to the uh, surveillance site personnel, we came to know that there was no data, uh, data person at the sites. There was no dedicated person to look after the uh, compilation of data and sending it to us. If they had a person, there was no dedicated workspace. They were working in the same lab and had a computer in some place. Other places, they did not have a computer dedicated to microbiology lab. Or if they had the computer, they didn't have the internet to send the reports to us through Excel. Or... And at some places, they were like, we don't have any training in data management. So how to compile it, how to use Excel, and so on. So in the end, there were some institutions that had sharing uh, data constraints. So all of these uh, findings, then uh, I being the member secretary of the AMR Surveillance Technical Working Group, I could take these findings to the Ministry of Health and Population, which is a focal point for AMR, and talk to them uh, through my studies policy brief and could highlight what was lacking and then I also briefed the, uh, during the AMR Surveillance Technical Working Groups, where the Fleming Fund, which is a big donor, is a part, along with WHO and the ministry stakeholders. And there we could uh, communicate our findings, and that resulted in actions being taken, such as we renewed the memorandum of understanding with many sites that were uh, having constraints regarding data sharing. We had updated SOPs and uh, AMR Surveillance Protocol, where they had new terms of uh, reference where they knew when to send the data, what type of data to send. And uh, with the help of Fleming Fund, we could provide computers and internet as well as improve the infrastructure at places. The surveillance sites themselves dedicated or pinpointed for people who would uh, work as uh, data personnel. And we conducted two sets of data management trainings. And this impact can be seen in uh, what we reported to GLASS at the global uh, platform. So you people can go to the class website and have a look. And so before we could uh, only see that five sites reported from the Bangladesh province, but after the study, all, all the nine sites are reporting the data. And this impact was also uh, at the national level because the similar situation is present in uh, all the other sites also. And the Fleming Fund, along with the ministry's initiation helped us do that. So initially there were 14 sites reporting the data and now it's 21. Initially, it was 66% complete data, but now we need to do a new study to get the new snapshot. So all this operational research helped me as a, a person with the excellent mentoring I got from to turn from a mentee to a mentor. We have a strong alumni group because we have 21 studies being uh, conducted in uh, our country and we have a better capacity and better networking. These are some snippets of my journey from mentee to mentor. And these are some uh, of the published studies. 
And this is my study for reference. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Saudi WHO TV, the conference uh, for uh, the conference people for inviting us to such a beautiful place and giving me an opportunity to uh, talk to such a uh, August gathering. I'd like to thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Now stay there because we'll just see if there's uh, one question before we move on to the next talk. Gentleman on the right is not even looking at me now. So I hope I haven't upset you. Okay. Uh, yes, sir, in the in the blue jacket there, please. Just have to wait while the microphone makes its journey. All right, thank you so much for that presentation. My name is Oyewale Ujibi from Nigeria, Institute of Mybrology specifically. I actually into surveillance practice and I noticed this is a kind of quality assessment mm -hmm. of the AMR surveillance. So under the dimension where you assess the quality of this AMR data reporting, you mentioned the indices, listed indices of consistency as well as timeliness. Well, I don't see the data of accuracy. I, I noticed that is very, very important indices in measuring quality. So that's, that was left out somehow. So it actually gave me worry that what's going on, you know, I want to just to know, is that deliberate or is not part of the scope or perhaps just give us a clarity on that, please. Thank you. So uh, if I get your question right, you wanted me to see the quality of data. So we, uh, when we were uh, starting this operational research, I put the parameters because quality is very vast. So we are looking at the quality of the lab testing by doing the uh, proficiency panels and all, but with data, we are like microbiologists. We don't know much about data. So I put up parameters. If it is complete uh, as per the class indices, then that is one uh, component of quality. If it is consistent, when I go and audit at the site, that is the other aspect. So that is also covered. If the drug bug combinations are as per the glass standard, which is supposed to be the gold standard for us, then that is another component of uh, quality. And sometimes uh, the timeliness is also important because if you don't get the data to us in time, we can't validate the data and then it can't be uploaded to the global platform. And when you get only 50% of the results up, for all the countries, you're not getting the bigger picture right. So the uh, results would be skewed. So that's why for me, the quality, I checked by these three par parameters. That is what only you took, because it's a vast, vast thing to look at data quality, and I'm not a data person myself. Okay. Thanks, Jyoti. Uh, we'll take some more questions in the panel, I think. But uh, as I said, we're, we're moving on. So uh, we heard earlier that perhaps one of the the greatest targets actually for combating antimicrobial resistance is focusing on the social determinants of health. And maybe the, the key social determinant of health is actually access to clean water. And so I'd now like to introduce uh, Lady uh, Adamako uh, from Ghana, uh, where she was actually conducting one of the first studies uh, of taking water samples and then looking into those samples uh, to see for the presence and absence of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and the importance of that, because these water effluents were being used in agricultural production. So, Lady, over to you, please. Hi, I'm Lady Adomakun from the Center for Scientific and Industrial Research in Accra, Ghana. Um, I'm pleased to present my study title, The Use of Wastewater for Agriculture. How safe, it, how safe it is, is it in Accra, Ghana? Um, so, Wastewater is an ideal hotspot for the development and transfer of antimicrobial resistance because it contains antibiotic residues as well as high concentrations of bacteria. So our study was carried out at the Legon Seaway Treatment Plant in Accra, Ghana, which treats waste from two districts and an adjacent stream. Here, effluents are discharged directly into this stream called Onyasia Stream. So here we see water being abstracted for irrigation via hoses and via a bucket. 
And here is the lettuce farm on the extreme left along the banks of the stream. So we wanted, because the stream is used for irrigation, wanted first to see whether the effluent that is coming out of the treatment plant, whether the treatment plant is, is able to adequately treat the wastewater. And secondly, we wanted to know whether the effluent is increasing contamination in this stream. And thirdly, to assess the quality of this stream water. So we set out to conduct an operational study to look at bacterial counts of E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Aeromonas hydrophila counts, and their antibiotic resistance in one, the legal and seaway treatments, plant influence and effluent, two, in the, in the stream, upstream and downstream. So our method. So this study was a cross-sectional study from January to June 2018. We looked at bacterial counts in wastewater and stream water, and then went ahead to do um, antimicrobial sensitivity testing on isolates. All exit approval was relevant exit approval were taken. And then all our methods were quality controlled according to international standards. So our study had three major findings. So the first is that um, in the treatment plant, we found a 99% reduction in bacterial counts. Please, um, please, you can see this in this bar chart, but please note that this uh, bar chart is in log scale. And where uh, brown represents influence and blue represents effluent. So our second finding was that in the stream, there was high contamination, bacterial contamination for all the organisms tested. And we saw about a 200-fold increase in bacterial counts when you compared upstream and downstream. And it's shown here in the bar chart where blue represents upstream and downstream represents, sorry, brown represents downstream. And again, this is in a log scale. So it was obvious that um, the contamination was not only coming from the treatment plant, but there were other sources of contamination downstream. And thirdly, in the stream, we saw high resistance to WHO critically important antibiotics, ranging from about 30% to 80%. So in summary, it's evident that the treatment plant is able to reduce bacterial contamination, thereby reducing anti um, environmental contamination. And then, uh, because the stream is used as a major source of ir irrigation, uh, it's highly contaminated. This implies a risk of uh, acquiring infections either through direct contact with the water from the farmers and consuming uh, lettuce, salad ve vegetables. So how did my study influence practice? So our study, after that study, uh, it reinforced the treatment plan's decision to reutilize the water for fish farming. Because there were times when um, bacterial counts were, were zero or close to zero. So in this picture, we see a fish uh, cage in the effluent, the final effluent pond. And secondly, after reading our paper, a team from Germany contacted us and are piloting the use of biochar filters uh, to reduce contamination in the stream. So I'd like to end my slide by telling you how sort of that benefited me. So after the regional uh, sorted, um, with the excellent mentorship I received, I became a mentor in the national sorted. And then after this, uh, uh, about four other colleagues of mine from my institute, the CSIR, also benefited from this. Uh, sorted has helped me demystify operational research, to know that I can do it myself, and it has helped me build uh, connections in One Health in Ghana and outside Ghana. So these are examples of us, the studies that were carried out for the national sorted. So this shows that uh, just in my institute, we have four people who are leading operational research studies. So this shows that sorted can build, build capacity using the operational research. So here is uh, the link to the papers for more information on both the regional and in the, the national sorted papers. Here's the link, to the link, the QR code to my paper. You can access this here. I'd like to say thank you to WHO, TDR, 
started the Accra Metropolitan Assembly and the CSIR for their support. And I thank you all for listening to me and I'm grateful for the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Okay, so if somebody could let me whether Mike is joining us online, is he there? If not, we will take uh, one question for Lady, if there's any questions, and then we'll take our online contribution. Yeah. Lovely presentation, thank you. So many, uh, many water purification plants weren't built to handle the removal of antibiotic or bacteria from the, what needs to be done to improve that? Because although you had good reduction, um, you didn't, in antibiotic levels, you didn't, it's still log two. So, I mean, it's still there. What do you think needs to be done? So, I think we need to um, invest in technologies that uh, completely eliminate bacteria from um, wastewater. This, so this plant is a wastewater stabilization pond. And then, yeah, maybe we, if we invest in more ponds, like more um, treatments like this. Thanks, Lady. And I think also the, the German studies is an interesting one in the use of biochar filters, hopefully low cost, uh, and how they can be used to clean up what, you know, the Oniasa stream is a particularly unpleasant uh, stream. So, yeah, how we use that. Okay, uh, let me know if the person online is with us. Uh, so now we're going to have, uh, which is always great fun, uh, to have a live presentation from London. Uh, let's see how this goes. So Mike Charland, uh, hopefully is there, is he also going to be talking about the use of uh, access, watch, and reserve. So these are the WHO categories of uh, um, how we actually uh, fr uh, framework the um, um, monitoring the use of uh, antibiotics. So if Mike is ready to go, then I will stop filling in. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, very much so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? <laughs> that wakes everybody up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice, nice. Great. Okay, I can't actually see the slides. Uh, but could you just put the camera up a little bit so we can see that I can see the slide as well? Would that be possible? That's fine. It's being screen sharing. Okay, thank you very much indeed for asking me to talk today. And I think this is very fits in very well with a lot of the other um, comments and discussions that have been having during the course of this morning. Um, so uh, I'm a, a pediatrician in London, but I'm talking today uh, on behalf of the antibiotic working group of the central medicines list. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the WHO central medicines list, a new aware antibiotic uh, book, which is being launched during the course um, of the antibiotic of antimicrobial awareness week. Next slide, please. So, uh, antibiotics have been a central part of the essential medicines list for uh, obviously all the way through since the first one in 1977. And some of the drugs that are actually on the, the first essential medicines list have uh, now still on the list, uh, obviously, uh, sort of nearly 50 years later. Next slide, please. So uh, the uh, and so over that period of time, uh, there's obviously been a, a, a fairly steady um, addition of new antibiotics coming into the essential medicines list, and uh, obviously some of the older ones have moved out. Because related to the sort of all of the work around antimicrobial resistance, the WHO asked the ML to completely review the antibiotics on the essential medicines list and think about how those could be regrouped or reclassified and trying to uh, thinking about how as we move into an area of uh, trying to optimize antibiotic use, how that can be improved. So in 2017, the expert committee then developed the AWARE classification. So this is really just a way of trying to group the many different antibiotics that there are out there, of course, into sort of simple classification group, A, access, very narrow spectrum, affordable antibiotics, widely available, watch uh, antibiotics, uh, broader spectrum antibiotics, specific indications, generally higher resistance, 
and toxicity potential and usually of higher cost. And reserve are the last antibiotics, last resort antibiotics used only when other drugs have failed and treatment of multi-resistant bacteria. And, and the CML has always provided, therefore, a sort of a what to use and has provided sort of classification in our system. In 2019, the committee expanded the AWARE classification to actually uh, over 250 antibiotics to allow um, drug utilization studies for member states, countries, other groups to consider how they could, how, what they're using antibiotics for, and how can they sort of classify those into sort of simpler groups. Um, there are around 40 antibiotics, actually 39 on the uh, essential medicines list, but you know, there are many, you know, 200 to 300 or so antibiotics that are commonly used globally, and uh, trying to group and classify those was, was going to be clearly an important way of trying to structure this future. And there's a new category, which I won't go into, which is not recommended, which is only inappropriate fixed dose combinations. And in 2019, the global program of work included a target indicator that a portion of all access antibiotics should be no more, should be more than 60% of total antibiotic use at the country level. Next slide, please. So that, you know, in 2021, uh, there was an update of the EML uh, as well and trying to update uh, that. And now there's about 8% of antibiotics. Uh, next slide, please. And, and though this provides you again with a sort of list of antibiotics, and we know that access antibiotics generally from recent systematic reviews and other data that access antibiotics use is associated with a lower selection of resistance, particularly um, for ESBL so that's a, a selection, um, and particularly in relationship to sort of amoxicillin. We're very well aware that all antibiotic use is associated with selection of resistance, but clearly some antibiotic use is associated with higher like probability of being infected with a, um, or, or colonized with a resistant organism afterwards. Next slide please. So, you know, though we have a lot of antibiotics out there that are, that are obviously um, that are being widely used, that of the antibiotics that are not on the essential medicines list, there are in fact many, many antibiotics, 100, over 100 antibiotics, very widely used, uh, that uh, particularly watch antibiotics, where it's not entirely clear exactly what, what they're being used for, um, uh, given that uh, they're often older third generation cephalosporins, quinolones, macrolides, and it wasn't entirely clear what their indications were. Next slide, please. So because of that, then the WHO therefore decided to the, would, and which is a new um, step for the essential medicines list, to work for work towards not only providing uh, sort of what to use, but uh, also how to use uh, antibiotics in the future. So the essential, um, and, and over the course of the last couple of years, uh, the antibiotic working group, uh, which other people in the room there, I think Mark Mendelson and others have been very helpful with in terms of developing this process, um, and now um, uh, the DG was launching now uh, this period of time, the, uh, the WHO Aware Antibiotic Book. Next slide, please. So this is uh, now um, uh, guidance for about 34 common infections in primary care and facility hospital setting, uh, both for children and adults. It covers acute bacterial infections only. The recommendations for empiric antibiotic treatments, you know, at the time where this patient's had a clinical diagnosis, um, and uh, but actually there's no um, but there's not really a base to that time on laboratory diagnostic. It provides a really a lot of detail and the guidance of making how you make the diagnosis, whether you want to give an antibiotic or not, um, focusing on particularly on low risk-based approach to prescribing, whether you need to give antibiotics, a low-risk patient with a minor respiratory tract infection, and then the choice of drug dose and duration. It has very simple short summaries of all the key clinical features. So it's seen very much as, as an educational tool. And the target audience really is all health professionals giving antibiotics. Next slide, please. And you can see that there's very simple graphics, really thinking about all of the key stewardship components of managing treatment and everything is color coded and all of and many other sort of kind of simple stewardship ways of trying to focus on optimal use of antibiotics. Next slide, please. Um, and particularly focusing around primary care, because as Mark was discussing earlier, there really is a real strong focus now, recognizing that over 90% of antibiotics used are in the primary healthcare setting. And this is increasingly recognized as one of the, the many uh, drivers for antibiotic resistance in humans, uh, of course. And in the uh, primary care setting, this points out that actually um, 
that nearly all of the common primary care infections either should be treated with no antibiotics for very mild infections in healthy adults, for example, unhealthy children with no underlying disease, but also otherwise if antibiotics are being given, then access antibiotics are recommended pretty well for nearly all primary care infections, apart from a very few sort of specific indications, obviously dysentery, um, bloody diarrhea, shigella salmonella, um, then, uh, then oh, it's clear that uh, watch antibiotic and macrolide quinolone may be appropriate for uh, some uh, STIs as well. But for the great majority of, of infections, then uh, access antibiotics are important. And uh, this obviously is clearly uh, uh, um, trying to lead into the key point, as we were discussing earlier on, in terms of universal health coverage, which provides information on the sort of on how you can need to provide access to access antibiotics. But for the very first time, sort of the AWARE book provides real details about exactly what antibiotics patients should be able to access in uh, primary healthcare settings as well as in the, in the uh, hospital setting. Exactly which drug and what dose and what formulation and what duration needs to be there, which allows sort of monitoring systems that have been evolved over many years to actually have uh, drive into the detail to make sure the drugs are there, obviously, in uh, not only in terms of whether they're there, but also at an affordable cost, and also, of course, in not in a substandard and falsified medicine. Next slide, please. So there is a, a, a clear sort of, this has been a very much, as we discussed, an implementation focused design, <clears throat> has this real one stop sort of shop um, in terms of all the comprehensive guidance. The WHO estimates this, is, this covers really over 90% of antibiotic prescribing. Um, although the book itself is a classic WHO meaty toma, 675 pages, um, it actually has really simple graphics for children, adults for each infection. There's a, has in multiple formats, it's going to be available on EML and the AWARE website. TGHN has been really helpful in, in trying to develop um, a simple sort of access to this, uh, to the book and to try and disseminate this more widely. And WHO, with the help of the Canadian governments, are now producing the WHO Aware Antibiotic App, which will be a single app on providing antibiotic guidance for 90% of treatment globally. And all of that will be available um, on, on, uh, on phones, so to kind of for all prescribers or anybody who's giving antibiotics, that is actually all nurses, pharmacists uh, as well. And obviously, this is all of the translation. So there's a, uh, uh, and this is going to be provided in multiple languages as well. Next slide, please. So I think the next steps now is that, you know, we've recognized that um, a number of, of aspects about this that we've been talking about is that allows us to sort of also to implement and to consider and development much more aware based policy goals and targets, basing, focusing really on safely reducing total and watch antibiotics. There's a whole capacity now, I think, and, and this follows on a lot of your early discussions about sort of data and using data, countries beginning to understand their own data and then develop locally based tools and locally based sort of ways in which a quality improvement program. And this, I think, is going to be an important part and very much an area where TGHN, I think, and all the partners we're discussing today can, can think about um, trying to use data, monitor process of data, and then think about sort of policy tools that are relevant uh, to them as well. Um, next slide, please. So I think I uh, just wanted to run through that at speed and hopefully try to allow some time for questions. I want to thank all the members of the EML Secretariat, Antibiotic Working Group, uh, all of the other AMR departments, of course, and all the external collaborators and partners who contributed and commented on the AWARE book. This will be updated uh, regularly, um, sort of sort of a brief update every two years and then a much more formal update every four years. Um, and there is a sort of a, we can discuss much more about sort of implementation plans. Everybody recognizes that guidance documents are not sufficient in their own to change anything. It's going to be very complex questions about how this book integrates with other national guidelines at the moment and other countries. But I think it's a, it's a useful step. And now uh, for WHO, it allows us sort of a stepping into uh, thinking about a lot of other implementation. To, uh, and there's going to be a considerable uh, focus on trying to uh, see how this will improve the quality of prescribing over the next course of the next few years. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. That was very clear and very well done, actually. One of the best uh, phone in uh, presentations I've seen for a number of years. We're now going to have a panel. So if the other speakers who are here in the room want to take their 
places. And while they're doing that, if there are some specific questions for Mike, uh, then I'll, uh, we'll, we'll take them now, Mike. Right, I can see one hand, and I'm just going to... Somebody, could, could you have to give me the mic? So, gentleman in the yellow, and then next to him, uh, Jim. So, we, we've got a couple of questions in the room. Oh, oh thank you. Um, I earlier said I work at the Uganda Virus Research Institute in Uganda. So, my question goes to the last presenter. I think I missed his name. Uh, the one online. Yeah. Yes. Um. You've you've uh, highlighted the okay the list you've updated as the list of the WHO antibiotics and the, the systems, but I in my institute where I work with viruses, there are very few curative agents, and yet the viral infection is one of the most well contained, even without definitive uh, treatment of cure. Somehow, the epidemic just comes and disappears. So, can we leverage on uh, how we respond to viral infection? Right now, we're having an Ebola outbreak in Uganda, but somehow it's being contained without any serious treatment. More of IPC. Um, two, um, we are talking about implementation science, but also we should be cognizant of the fact that implementation science cannot be done accurately without effective diagnosis or effective uh, biomedical science research. Uh, for example, many countries, including Uganda, we still use wide test to diagnose for enteric fever or typhoid. And for you to implement, you need to have accurate information and data. How are we going to strike that delicate balance between implementation science, but also not negating the lab-based uh, research that generates this data? Thank you. Okay, there were two questions in there. I don't know if you got them, Mike. The, the second uh, br briefly, thanks. Yeah. So I, I think you know. So the focus of the t uh, presentation today was sort of kind of on optimal treatment, sort of with antibiotics. Um, but uh, clearly, there is a real unmet need for a range of uh, treatment guidelines for many other viral infections. Um, uh, you know, the, the central medicines list has does cover a whole range of other in, anti infectives, and this is a first step. I think there is a there is a, a clear, you know, this is for EML has been going since 1977. This is the first time the EML has moved out to just providing a list, but actually moving into how those drugs should be used, sort of. And I think that is a, a, a step. Clearly, antifungals, um, obviously, and a whole range of other, other medicines on the essential medicines list um, that could be potentially moved on. And, and, and I think this is a step by step process. Um, from relationship to the diagnostics, absolutely. So we completely agree with that. Um, and this was done in really, this book was done in collaboration with the essential diagnostics list, essential diagnostic list on the EML, and indeed, of course, integrated closely with surveillance programs and GLASS uh, uh, as well. So coming back to the sort of previous speaker, then actually, you know, this is all part of trying to put this together. So there is the concept of the, you know, the pipeline of drugs, thinking about sort of how surveillance, surveillance then informs guidance, you know, guidance then informs access and secure initiative. So there's now a sort of much more clear, I think, emerging process by which the WHO programs begin to sort of work together into clear surveillance and, and process networks. And diagnostics coming in through the central diagnostic list, I think, are, are uh, clearly a core, a core part of this sort of kind of process. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And I, I think, again, if I may just add a little bit on your question around where does implementation science fit? So certainly within the programs we've been supporting in TDR, we've had a number of studies based in hospitals where they've been looking at uh, the prescription of drugs before a diagnosis has been confirmed, and then what subsequently the diagnosis was uh, after a sample has been taken. And I think creating that feedback loop between the drugs that were given and then the confirmation of what the actual infection was, and then trying to shorten that time as much as possible uh, is certainly a, a role for uh, using the analysis of implementation research with that sort of routinely collected data. So I think that that's one of the ways in which I would see implementation science having a role to play here.
Okay, we've got another question for Mike, and then um, is that a question for Mike or for the panel more generally? Yeah, okay, that's fine. So we've got two uh, more in the room, it seems. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Fadal Usman. I am a researcher currently working in Sudan, affiliated with the Sudanese National Academy of Sciences. So my question is for my brother from Sierra Leone, and I think Ronnie can actually speak to it okay. too. Okay, can I, if it's for Sierra Leone, can we hold that? Oh, and I was just going to collect questions for Mike, and then we'll go into the panel, if you don't mind. Is, is your question for Mike? Yeah, yeah. The lady just neck in the in the one of the striking pink outfit. Very nice. Thank you. I'm Dr. Jasmine Sultana, working in ICDDRB Bangladesh. So my question is for Mike: is that um, what we have noticed in the community regarding the use of Group A antibiotic and Group Watch antibiotic? So. Um, at first, when a patient comes, um, usually physicians follow to reduce the symptoms, they use the watch antibiotic group, the broad spectrum antibiotic. Then they do, then they suggest the diagnosis, culture, and sensitivity. So, regarding the diagnosis, there are few factors that affects the specific antibiotic use because it took time, then it costly. So, for poor people, sometimes they don't do go for the diagnosis uh, or the laboratory investigation but they just uh, use the broad spectrum antibiotic. So in this case, if we want to increase the use of specific antibiotics, we need a low cost, low time consuming investigation method to increase the use of uh, narrow spectrum antibiotics. So in that case, can you shed light on like any new research on developing the, this type of tools for low income communities? Uh, so that we can uh, like reduce the broad spectrum antibiotic use in the community. Thank you so much. Okay. Did you get that question right? Yeah, I did. Thank you, Rush and Eden. So it's a, it's a sort of key question. I think we have to recognize that actually probably 50 to 60% or so of antibiotic prescribing figures vary markedly inter internationally are for respiratory tract infections. You know, and predominantly what we're talking about here is mild, minor respiratory tract infections. Clearly sick patients with you know, sick, you know, who are unwell, underlying disease and other, other groups and they're vulnerable. Uh, but actually an awful lot of prescribing internationally is for sort of more relatively minor respiratory tract infections as well. So the, the you know, the aware book provides, you know, is very focused on no antibiotic care and is also very focused on sort of if you are going to use an antibiotic, there is no evidence that actually broader spectrum antibiotics or third generation quinolones um, and other drugs um, are actually of any, any benefit in relationship to most respiratory infections respiratory tract infections. We have to recognize that actually the GLASS data suggests that the rates of high-level pneumococcal resistance are 2%. There is not an AMR problem, in particular in some pathogens. Group A strep is still, for yeah. pharyngitis, is still sensitive at the same level as it was you know, 50 to 60 years ago. So we have to be very careful about the need and where really the need is. So I, I, I recognize entirely, obviously, the issues around fever and the possibility of, uh, of, you know, of uh, typhoid and other particular areas, which are complex areas, and also the issues around diagnostics um, areas. But actually, the, the AWARE book provides sort of evidence-based guidance for the management of the great majority of respiratory tract infections where diagnostics are not required, where there's actually no evidence at the moment that there is an added utility associated with diagnostics. And this is a clinical risk-based management. So I think we just need to be really careful about where actually diagnostics are required and where they're not, which clinical infections they are and which they're not. And also what where uh, and the guidance in the primary care setting suggests that clinical examination and a history taking and then empiric prescribing is where is is and then an access antibiotics is the appropriate management strategy for the great majority of patients with a respiratory tract infection. Um, and I think that's the sort of key focus. And um, we have to recognize that there are literally billions of courses of broad spectrum watch antibiotics being used in the primary care sector. Um, and this is adding very significant costs to families, really significant costs to healthcare systems, driving resistance and with increased toxicity. It is unclear what the clinical utility of those agents are. And that is not a diagnostics issue. That is a health systems issue. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Mike. So I'm now going to open up the floor again for our panel. And Mike, you're able to stay online? Okay, yes. Another indeed. question. Okay, great. So I'm going to come back to my colleague there from Sudan. Uh, please ask your question uh, if you can. Yeah. And then 
we have the panel. So yeah, please raise your hand and we'll come to you as, as we go. So Thank you. Uh, so um, my question is that uh, it seemed that in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone the issue was an issue of resources. So by, by providing resources, you were able to uh, resolve the problem of data documentation, data reporting, ultimately leading to action. In Sudan, we have a major issue with documentation. And we worry that it isn't just an issue of resource availability. It may have to do with training or a general appreciation for the importance of documentation. And also in Sudan, so in your case, it seemed that through governance, you were able to promote the data reporting. In Sudan, we also have an issue of, of governance. So I was wondering what solutions would be possible outside of the realm of governance to possibly promote the or, or uh, promote the appreciation for data documentation. Yep. yep. If you can, yeah. Um, thank you so much, my brother from Sudan. Um, talking about resources, uh, first we are ministry, so we have our ministry and we have our annual budgets. So the advocacy, like what I went presenting, we say we have partner and that support us and we have the internal fund from the ministry. So yes, we don't have that much resources, but at least for what we have um, received from FAO and the World Bank Credit say, we can sustain and maintain them. That one is ongoing, like the replacement of tires, fuel, these tablets got spoiled and then we, and then we train because training is key. Mm -hmm. Since these people are not vets, so they are animal production officers and livestock officers who are trained for three, four years. So we give them the basic training on the electronics means they are going to use because moving someone from paper base to electronic, you see how, so the resources are not like 100%, but we can sustain this one that's why you are seeing improvement in terms of reporting. And then for the completeness as well, we need to um, move further to see how we can achieve the 100 because that's what we want. So that, uh, like for example, the withdrawal period need to be observed when reporting. You know, if I give an antibiotic to an animal today, you need five days at least, but we are not observing that. And people you can give today, the following day, the animal is killed, and then the next day is in the system of a human. So you can have, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Leno. I think there was, yes, gentleman there and then the lady at the back. So, and very hopefully you're both wearing yellow so I can track that very nicely. Oh, see, I, no, I can't win. Right, if I look over here, I'm in trouble. So, and then I'm definitely coming over to the left-hand side next. Okay. Yes, Please. thank you so much, Robert. Uh, my question goes to, to Mike. Um, uh, Mike, thank you so much for the presentation about that, the AWARE tool. Um, my name is Wubafos. I'm from Uganda, and uh, my area of specialization is pharmacology, and I'm currently in charge of uh, uh, clinical teaching and uh, rotations of the MPCTB program in Kingston University. Um, it's evident that uh, this new tool you're presenting to us is uh, derived from the original essential medicines uh, concept of, uh, of, of the UNWHO. Um, however, I want you to clarify, I don't know whether you left it out deliberately or it's, or it's not there, or it's abstract, about uh, the, the end user, the reconciliation of the gaps with the end user of uh, these tools. If you notice, with the original essential medicines uh, concept tool, uh, where most of the uh, LMIC countries have der derived their national clinical guidelines, um, you find that... Uh, these tools are, are, are developed, but you find again, most of the problems are coming from there. Uh, my colleague from Uganda earlier on mentioned in the morning presentations that you find we have issues where um, you can walk into a pharmacy, a community pharmacy and get an antibiotic, uh, but it, it gets back to the point of someone in those pharmacies not being able to take responsibility of um, how they use these tools. In Uganda, we've just uh, used our recent um, Uganda clinical guidelines whereby everyone has a responsibility. But the actual um, use and uh, guidelines for use of these tools is left in abstract in that it's taken for a given that if someone is a medical professional, they will take responsibility and use these guidelines uh, responsibly and also distribute these medicines responsibly. However, 
we noticed that if it, it was just left in abstract, abstract, the use of these tools. So my, my question is, uh, in this new AWARE tool, is there reconciliation of uh, these gaps here for the use of these tools by the end user professionals? Thank you. Great, thank you much indeed. Well, I only had 10 minutes, so, uh, <laughs> so it's difficult to get everything in. And, uh, and as a number of people in the audience knows, I could happily talk to about AWARE for uh, days uh, as well. So the, the uh, I mean, there's a number of questions to unpack in that, uh, I think. <clears throat> so the, the I mean, the, obviously the first is obviously is, un, is access over the counter medicines. And uh, there is at the moment an enormous push from the WHO that are going through to focus on that. And indeed to change many of the legal frameworks associated with that sort of globally. And uh, there is going to be in 2024, a United Nations General, General Assembly meeting on AMR, a high level meeting on AMR. And that's going to be one of the key features to try and get many countries to try and considerably increase their focus on the unregulated access uh, to antibiotics. I think the, 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 I mean, the other aspect of this, of course, is this is really much focused on all uh, providers of antibiotics. So it's not just focused on doctors, it's focused on anybody who provides antibiotics. And that includes a whole range of, of, of groups, as we were discussing, and that includes uh, pharmacy as well. I think this leads us into um, local implementation um, if you're looking at proportions of patients that are actually turning up to pharmacy, for example, then thinking about the groups that uh, then uh, what, whether what proportion got antibiotics or not, what proportion, what antibiotics they get, are all things that could be monitored and, and implemented as sort of local tools. I think we need to move much more to focus on the sort of development of tools. We've got hospital antibiotic point prevalence surveys. Why don't we start moving into primary care point prevalence surveys? Why don't we start sort of beginning to provide local tools that people can use to monitor and implement use. So there are, I think, um, many ways that actually end users uh, can get engaged within that. And just to go back to the discussion from Faith, and I apologize, I didn't sort of tackle that in chat, but I was going to talk about it here. So I, I think actually that there is a, a, there's a whole section in the book about what is the role of all of the different groups what is the role of health professionals? What is the role of professional societies? What is the role of, of um, sort of of, of uh, social science? What is the role of sort of of the community within this to try and promote responsible use? This is much larger than a single book can do, but there is at least you know chapters you know on that in the book that tries to lay out some of what are potentially the roles of different groups, and so that's a step I think to put out framework within there. The where is a framework. Um, it's just a simple framework. It can be used, in fact, across the whole One Health spectrum so that there's a common language of how antibiotics are used, focusing on access antibiotics, reducing unnecessary watch antibiotics, really thinking about how you're using reserve. So it's just a language, and, and hopefully it'll be a language that we can use to build the conversation over the course of the next decade. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Yes, so the lady at the back there, please. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is uh, Shakira Amine. Um, I have a bachelor's in uh, pharmacy and uh, master's in epidemiology and biostatistics. I'm from Uganda. Um, I understand that some of the things that can um, lead to antimicrobial resistance, this question actually goes to Mike. Uh, we have um, the active pharmaceutical ingredients and then the excipients and then the impurities. Realize that uh, if the API is lesser than it's supposed to be, then that can lead to resistance. And then if the excipients that you're using are of poor quality, then that can end up affecting the pharmacokinetics of the drug. And in the end, that can lead to um, um, antimicrobial resistance. And then the other is uh, about the impurities which are come along during the manufacturing or during the storage. So I'd like to know uh, what has WHO put in place at the manufacturing level to ensure that the API that is a uh, being used regardless of which brand of drug is is uh, as required, and then the excipients of good quality, um, as well as the storage and all the good manufacturing practices being followed. What are the things? Okay, thank you. I don't know, Mike, if how much of that you want to refer to. But... Uh, well, it's a complex issue. So, I mean, very briefly, I mean, obviously, uh, for substandard and falsified medicines, you know, there is a, a, a large work stream of this within the WHO. And it's clear that antibiotics are the most common medicines where there is an issue with substandard and falsified medicines. Not surprisingly, because they're the most common medicines used sort of kind of globally. Um, and so uh, there is a strong sort of kind of focus within, within that. 
We have to recognize that actually, um, so it's only recently we're trying to work out how many uh, manufacturers there are of antibiotics globally. And there are thousands, literally thousands of, of manufacturers of antibiotics globally. The great majority of API is manufactured in China. Um, and then, then, but obviously the manufacturing process then in terms of, of then the production of that is you know, diversified globally. Um, and so that then becomes a very complicated issue in terms of all of how you monitor um, the quality of the product across many thousands of, of uh, then manufacturers and generic uh, providers of antibiotics, you know, that are actually large, many of them you know, are now diversified in many countries of course are now building very rapidly, building their own uh, manufacturing capacity in Africa, particularly and, and also globally. So it's not a specialist area, and there is a whole, whole stream of work around this, but I would say that actually the AWARE book provides you know, a really clear focus of, OK, so of the 250 antibiotics that are out there and that you know, we have 40 that we really need to focus on. And so when you're trying to monitor uh, substandard and falsified medicines, if that's the 40 that we really need to focus on, those are the ones we think we really need to make sure that they are of high quality. It begins to target that, that, that a little bit better. Thanks. OK, thank you for that. Yes, one more. I think we have no, no. We have time for at least two two questions. So right. thank you very please much. Keep raising uh, your hand, please. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing the microphone to the side of the room. Why not? You're most welcome. Uh, the lady has asked me to go first because she has a ton of questions. So I, I know someone is in trouble. Uh, but mine is uh, sorry. My name is Melvin Abubate. I work in Ghana at uh, the Kumasi Center for Collaborative Research. Mine is more of a, a comment than a question, if I may. Okay. And it really is about the storytelling around One Health. And I, I have interacted with a lot of people on One Health. I can speak to them at length for, say, an hour. I'm done, and they have no clue what I'm talking about. Of course, they can grasp it at a conceptual level. But on the ground, it basically means nothing. And today, I have seen quite a number of the things I tend to talk about, that we need to be more deliberate, use real stories. So for instance, in 2019 in Ghana, there was a small outbreak of rabies. And if you use a relatable story like that, you just draw the life cycle of rabies, you can discuss many of the issues that One Health wants to contend with to people, and it's easy for them to grasp. So Leno spoke about how you know the veterinary services work. So on one hand, under the Ministry of Agriculture in uh, Sierra Leone, if I'm right, we have a similar dynamic in Ghana. So Ministry of Agriculture, Veterinary Services Department under that. Then we have the Ministry of Health and Ghana Health Service. In rabies management, this work is done. The groundwork is done by the Ministry of Agriculture, but because the benefit, so to speak, is for human health. The Ministry of Health takes the credit. So that introduces some complexity in their working relationship, which is one of the issues you want to address in One Health. So I find that you can give a lecture on One Health, in quotes, without even using the term One Health at all, maybe once or twice. And people will grasp it when you are using real, relatable stories with actionable points. I've seen some of that today, and it's something I think we should encourage a lot in the One Health uh, discourse. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I would also uh, recommend we gave some links earlier. Certainly, Ronnie did in his talk, and in some of the talks we heard, we we just published twelve new studies from Ghana, and I think at least three or four of them were agricultural in nature. So you may well find it interesting to go back to the original papers. Today, we only had five minutes each speaker, so we tried to just give a flavor of what we're trying to do. Now, please, here's your chance. Hi. Okay, so um, my name is Venus, Venus Nabwachua from Paul. I also work at K um, KCCR. Um, I'm more into um, mobile diagnostics that um, employs molecular techniques. All right, so um, since... Um, Melvin made a point that highlighted on ministries coming together. And I think my first question, uh, I'll start with what I have for Methin. Um, when he was having given the presentation, he was um, highlighting on lessons learned so far. And then, then two of them were striking. 
which was um, bringing ministries together to improve One Health. Um, and then the other was a, a way to improve um, rapid clinical diagnostics. Yes, so I wanted to ask Methane how or how he intends or what he thinks can, can be done to improve that with respect to achieving a One Health um, approach. And then um, my other question is to um, Lady. <laughs> yeah, um, you said um, for your work, you realized um, um, water from um, the treatment plant um, had reduced bacterial load. And so um, you try to encourage people to use that. Um, I wanted to find out um, people who do not have or who are not around, especially farmers, who are not around um, the treatment plant area, um, how are you going to, and they use um, downstream water often for irrigation. You mentioned that in your introduction. So I wanted to find out how, I, how you're going to get the information you, um, you got from your um, work to encourage them not to use the stream because I don't see how a farmer would go past a stream close to his farm to get um, water from another irrigation um, for irrigation from all from another irrigation site. And then the other question um, is for Mike. Yes, um, please, I wanted to find out um, on what criteria no criteria was the uh, categorization for the assess, watch, and reserve um, antibiotics based on? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, so, oh, sorry. Thank you. Hang on, Mike. We, we will come yep. to you last, I think. Uh, so I think it's Melvin and and then Lady, if you want to answer that question. So Melvin first and then. Yeah. We definitely need um, lots of investments in terms of um, uh, developing really rapid drug, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, diagnostic tests. That is something that is quite critical because uh, they, when you look at the at the landscape uh, in the African region, most labs um, are not capacitated and most labs don't have any microbiology and so they cannot do any tests and really for stewardship uh, that becomes one of uh, uh, really the major challenges and so we just have to invest uh, um, into uh, into RBTs. I think it's critical. The issue around um, working um, across One Health um, I think it it continues to and I think it's it's very disturbing. You know, we shall be doing a NAP review um, in Zambia after next week, and I've been quite busy developing uh, uh, tools and that we're going to use, and they have not really worked together, especially with the environmental sector. It's always left behind in many countries. They're not in meetings, and they are not involved. So how do we bring them over, and how do we show that uh, this one health you know, um, that actually EMA is a cross-cutting issue. There have to be deliberate efforts. And I think that uh, there are things that uh, we can use really a bottom-up approach and things we need, uh, this top-down approach. Governments, in my opinion, need to take lots of responsibilities and initiatives because really implementation of an app by and large needs resources, it, you know, and those resources they can provide, but we can also use, you know, uh, we uh, we need to come along with the communities uh, because a larger a larger portion of antibiotic use uh, is in communities, local pharmacies, uh, drug stores, the markets that are selling all these molecules. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, so I mentioned that it's the treat the management of the treatment plants that is reutilizing the water and not the farmers. Yes, so I said, yes. And then the stream, with the stream, um, a team is uh, piloting the use of biochar. It's an affordable way of treating water. However, after the study, we had a stakeholder meeting um, where uh, many stakeholders were present and including um, reps from Ministry of Agriculture. So we recommended encouraging farmers to use safer irrigation methods like drip irrigation, as opposed to using the bucket or uh, yeah, where the, um, there will be direct contact uh, on the lettuce with the contaminated water. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, lady. Yeah, it's true. I mean, again, it's uh, this particular example 
is a good example of one health because it's <clears throat> it's the a potential risk of human health different practices within agriculture you can mitigate uh, that risk so if you use say drip irrigation you're less likely to have a contamination of salad crops than if you're using overhead irrigation those types of things and then this new study you know if uh, biochar can actually be shown to be cost effective at taking out the the bacteria from those streams then that may be another way forward Finally, Mike, to you, and I think if I remember the question correctly, it was how are the aware categories arrived at? And I guess how are they kept up to date, I suppose? So, and that's, Thanks. That was the final question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. No, it's a really critical question. So the sort of general principles of aware are, you know, are that um, efficacy, safety, uh, resistance, and sort of kind of impact on the wider aspects of microbiome and, and other components. So those are the sort of four components. The actual, um, in the update, uh, then Master uh, undertook a sort of a, a major reviews and systematic reviews of sort of over a thousand clinical trials to try and work out for each of the different clinical infections, ear infections, throat infections, you know, urine infections, et cetera, which are the antibiotics that are sort of that provide the you know, equal or, or clinical efficacy to try and identify what are the, um, the optimal antibiotics for each of the categorization. And, and wherever possible, therefore, um, that provides the underpinning of the sort of access and watch as, as antibiotics. Um, then obviously looking at uh, the selection of resistance we've discussed them before, and then safety and, and then of cost um, as, as that comes through. So I think it evolves over time and you know, it has evolved already and it will evolve um, because obviously if more data emerges, um, in particular in relationship to sort of kind of uh, particularly in relationship to some of the health economic components, particularly in terms of sort of clinical outcomes, um, then I think there will be an evolution of this structure over over sort of over the the next number of years, um, and I and um, uh, broadly the you know the uh, watch antibiotics are very similar to the critically important antimicrobials from animal health. There's trying to be an alignment of this across the sort of kind of one health uh, component and reserve antibiotics really are now many of those are now much more focused on uh, antibiotics that actually potentially can also go through the secure initiative, which is being developed by the WHO, which is to think about how um, those drugs can then get funding for access to new antibiotics in uh, LMIC settings. So I think it's a it's a it's a it's a the framework um, will emerge and will evolve, um, but the general principles are uh, ill related to that overall structure um, of the sort of of efficacy, uh, safety, cost, um, and impact wider wider impact. Thanks. Great, thank you. So I think we've reached uh, just a little bit over the time for this session. So thanks very much for your attention. I won't attempt to summarize everything, but I think the things that that sort of stick in my mind are the need for frameworks, as Mike has said, and those categorizations, but also what they only really come alive in the field and in the different areas where we're working when people actually take the data, use that data, analyze it, uh, and then feed that back. So getting those feedback loops so that we can actually control uh, and in introduce, uh, we often hear about stewardship, but actually put stewardship uh, into practice. I know we've run out of time, you know. Um, <laughs> so I know it's unfortunate. I know the time is limited. What I can suggest uh, for those of you with burning questions, which are good, uh, we will be moving on this afternoon for a discussion around what are the priorities uh, and the use of implementation research in a One Health approach. So turn your question around into a research question, add it into the priority list, and let's see how we can go from there. Um, so I, that's the end of this session. I would just like us to thank our speakers. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so um, while we are trying to get set you down, uh, the technical team will give us break video three and four. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Walter Agingu. I'm presenting an abstract on capacity of laboratories and surveillance sites for Neisseria gonorrhea, culture and antimicrobial resistance testing in public hospitals within Kisumu County. MD infection is of public health importance as it affects about 78 million adults worldwide, 11.4 million of whom are in Africa. The infection also affects quality of life 
and facilitates the risk of HIV and other STI transmission and acquisition. Historical background of M uh, antimicrobial resistance to Neisseria gonorrhea can be traced back to 1930 when sulfonamides were introduced and recommended for treatment. From that time to date, several antibiotics, antimicrobial classes have been used for NG treatment due to the development of resistance of bacteria over time. Treatment of NG infection is done using syndromic management in developing countries like Kenya due to lack of essential lab diagnostic facilities. This process, which uses predetermined classes of antimicrobial regimens, is threatened by antimicrobial resistance developed by certain necessary or rare strains. Surveillance is therefore proposed as an intervention to control the spread of these necessary gonorrhea strains in the communities. Currently, much is not known about the capacity of public hospitals to act as surveillance sites for necessary gonorrhea infections in developing countries. The objective of this study was therefore to assess surveillance capacity for antimicrobial resistance necessary gonorrhea strains in public hospitals within Kisumu County, Kenya. In this study, cross-sectional data were collected from 12 randomly selected public hospitals classified as level 4 and above in Kisumu County. Findings of the study indicate that all the urban hospitals studied had 36.4% of the essential equipment for diagnosing necessary gonorrhea compared to 18.2% in rural hospitals. 56.3% of consumables essential for diagnosing necessary gonorrhea were lacking in all the study sites, while 91.7% of the sites did not have capacity to perform culture and drug susceptibility testing. Discussion. All of the study sites reported having qualified lab staff. Only level four, only level five hospital labs showed some capacity to perform bacterial phenotyping but not genotyping due to lack of some essential equipment and consumables. Conclusion, these results should enable the government to identify hospitals with some capacity, which can be built faster with less capital to initiate antimicrobial resistance surveillance. Con uh, recommendations, at least one level five public hospital in every county needs to be well equipped to act as surveillance site for Neisseria gonorrhea testing. Some level four public hospitals should also be identified for sample collection, processing, storage, and transport to the dedicated surveillance sites. Thank you. Can we put our hands together for water again for that? Um, for time's sake, we have to halt the other four videos of which we do at interval as we continue in this symposium. Uh, I would like to at this juncture, hand over the microphone to Dr. Lees to guide us on how we are going to move in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Pius. Is it working? Yeah. I should say that um, Pius has also been like involved with the AMR Hub for the last year, assisting um, or working alongside um, Doug Keane, and has been just such an amazing integral part of the Hub. So thank you very much. Um, yes, the lightning talks, fantastic. Um, we will try to get through them all today, but don't worry if you think people are missing them because we will want to put them up on the Global Health Network as well. So they will be available. And the whole session is being recorded as well. Um, so this afternoon, um, we're a little bit thinner on the ground. I don't know if, <laughs> if it's going to increase, but um, I think the, the lure of Cape Town maybe have has kicked in a bit. Um, but that's great. That means the people who really want to be here are here, which is fantastic. So we're going to um, get back to things with our keynote um, speaker, um, Tina Rika um, Jürgensen from WHO, um, HQ in Switzerland, um, who's already been introduced earlier. So I'm, for, for timing, I'm just going to ask her to um, to get going on her presentation, which is um, One Health Priority Research Agenda, and which um, really leads into the breakout session, which Tim has, has been uh, instrumental at designing. Um, so we all hope that um, you'll really throw yourselves into that. Thank you very much.
Okay, so yeah, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to share with you work developing a One Health Priority Research Agenda. Um, it is um, it is a joint project between uh, FAO, Food and Agricultural Organizations of UN, the UN Environmental Program, WHO, and the uh, World Organization for Animal Health. Um, yeah, you've already seen the, and heard the threats of AMR, and this is our WHO Director General who, who says that the growing, growing threats send us back to the time before antibiotics, and we already heard about this this morning. Um, he also states that AMR impacts every sector, and every sector must be engaged in the response across health, agriculture, and environment, and also the private sectors. Ah. Next slide, please. Ah, okay. So this is just to explain to you um, what the quadripartite is. The quadripartite is an alliance between the four organizations, FAO, um, OIE, uh, WHO, and UNEP. And the aim is to accelerate a coordinated a strategy on human, animal, and ecosystem health. A memorandum of understanding was signed earlier this year, and this was the date in March when it happened. And you can see on the picture the four organizations, the director generals, uh, showing the memorandum. So when you hear about the quadripartite at global level, it's referring to these four organizations and their joint efforts. Okay, so coming to the agenda I'm going to present to you, I'm going to give you some background, the aim of scope of the agenda, the methodology, sh share with you the preliminary research questions, and then a conclusion. And after that, I'll give you an introduction to the breakout sessions. So the background for this work is um, the WHO Global Action Plan, which calls for strengthening knowledge and evidence based through surveillance and research. And there's a specific request for a research agenda. It should be mentioned that WHO is also developing a human health research agenda, and the other organizations are looking into um, their specific areas of, of work. Um, in 19, when No Time to Wait came out, it was emphasized further that the, the, the need for a One Health approach to AMR. So this work comes out of the uh, these documents. So yeah, why a One Health approach? I think we heard a lot this morning about why it's needed, but it's really to emphasize that bacteria circulate between the different sectors, animal, humans, agriculture, the environment, and with that also AMR circulates. Um, this is a, <clears throat> this is a, a figure uh, that shows antibiotic residues reported across the one health spectrum. And as you can see, residues are found basically everywhere in, a, in the environment. So if a person is treated, it's likely to spread to all, to all parts of the ecosystem. Um, that's also why uh, we need interdisciplinary and multi-sectoral responses. However, there are as we also heard, major evidence gaps on where transmission happens, how it happens, um, what it does, and what we can do to intervene. Um, the, the research agenda that I'm um, the focal point for is looking at the interface between sectors. So the aim of the research agenda is really to catalyze scientific interest amongst researchers and also um, more interest from donor side to provide and to provide a direction for investment in One Health AMR. Um, the exercise has been mapping research gaps, uh, AMR at the interface and trying to identify and prioritize these questions. And the, so the criteria are that, that they should inform country activities, guidelines and policies. And a quadripartite report will be published early next year with the result of this work. To emphasize the scope of this, as mentioned, it's focusing on the interface. So it's 
focusing on research that involves more than one sector. It's a global exercise, um, and the focus is on, on bacteria and fungi. Uh, the time frame is up to 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals time frame, also recognizing that when you work between sectors, it often takes a bit longer. What is out of scope of this research agenda is product development and diagnostic development. And again, research related to only one sector. The methodology that has been uh, applied to this uh, exercise is a modified Delphi methodology um, using an inclusiveness approach. There are, there's multi-sectoral and multi-interdisciplinary input to the process, and it's following a guidance that was published by TDR, by Rob Terry, um, recently, uh, how to undertake or a systematic approach to do research priority setting exercises. Initially, this was planned to be a face-to-face -face, um, process, but due to COVID, it ended up uh, as an online exercise. So just to come back to the strategic objectives of this agenda, the first one is to understand, improve our understanding of transmission of AMR. Where does it happen? And what are the drivers of AMR transmission? And what's the actual impact? There are still huge evidence gaps in this area. Then the second objective is how do we strengthen the evidence base for interventions? How do we prioritize between these? What are the, <clears throat> what are the cultural and, and social behavioral insights that are needed to get um, interventions to work in the real world? Very much linked to the implementation research that we've been discussing um, in the morning. And then the last strategic pillar is develop the evidence to advocate for prioritization of AMR. How do we make the argument so we get the political buy-in and the willingness to invest in this? So um, initially, um, we did a very long uh, scoping exercise trying to identify which areas should be addressed in this, in this agenda. And it ended up with five strategic pillars or five pillars, and you can see them on this slide. They are not mutually exclusive. It's the interface and there's a lot of overlap between them, but one is transmission, another on integrated surveillance, interventions, and then behavioral insights and change. Mark mentioned that we need to consider this. Um, it's one of the pillars. And then the policy and economics, which would include legislation as well as um, uh, governance structures. In addition, there are some cross-cutting issues, which is uh, gender, vulnerable population, very much the equity dimension, and then sustainability. And the focus of this agenda is to support um, policies in low and middle income countries. So this is to outline the process, the five pillars, research question mapping, and then the prioritization. And now we are developing the research agenda, which will be a report coming out next year. But of course, this is just the starting point. Um, during the Delphi process, uh, the experts who were included in, in this exercise were asked to rate the questions against this matrix. So in the first one, there was a screening question saying, is this research important? Is it a real evidence gap? In the following Delphi rounds, um, they were rating the questions against, will it strengthen uh, research capacity in low and middle income settings? Is the research inclusive? Will it consider equity dimensions? Um, is it impactful? Will it really move the needle when we talk about impact on AMR control um, and mitigation? And then is it realistic? Is it actionable in low resource settings within the given time frame? So these are, are the criteria that were scored against. Um, in the exercise, there were 98 top experts uh, recruited on the basis of being an expert in One Health and or AMR and or a scientific discipline that could contribute to the area. So there was a broad range of expertise. I might even have missed some in this, in this list of experts, but it was a truly multidisciplinary exercise. 
there was a global representation and a gender balance. Still knowing that this is um, an area where you often have experts coming from the global north. There were 18 to 21 experts per pillar and three rounds of Delphi. And you can see the compliance rates in the, in the slide. So these are the preliminary results, uh, the, the top two in each of the questions in each of the um, pillars. It should be mentioned that these are not really questions, they're more broader areas that can be interpreted in many different ways, also depending on the setting. I should mention that this is partly a technical exercise, but it's very much also an advocacy exercise, looking at data from the global AMR and D hub, the dashboard. <clears throat> We found that there were approximately 6% of projects and funding that went into projects that truly involved more than one sector. So this is also an exercise trying to advocate to more investment in projects that goes across more than one sector. And I was happy to see yeah. that JPI AMR had a lot of projects that had at least um, a, some aspects of this. Um, yeah, so these are the, 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 the different quite broad areas um, that have been identified. So for transmission, what do um, IPC practices, how do they um, impact the development and circulation of AMR? What impacts transmission, broad areas? For surveillance, how do you make uh, adequate laboratory and human sources capacity to do this? And how do you triangulate meaningfully the data that you collect? Policy and economics, what would a One Health AMR socioeconomic impact assessment look like? Um, and then another question on relevant cross-cutting and spe sector-specific AMR policies. We, we talked about AMR sensitive and AMR um, earlier on the surveillance system. So this is a bit thinking the same AMR sensitive and AMR um, policies. Then behavioral insights and change, barriers to behaviors related to AMR, and how can we translate um, behavioral um, strategies, interventions um, to different contexts? We already talked about immunization. There's a behavioral component to that. How do we get high acceptance of immunization programs? Interventions about translated scale up implementation research. Um, and then again, challenges to systematic collection and analysis of data impact the session. So these are the preliminary results of the top questions. Um, so just in conclusion, um, during the process, it became very evident that there's a lot of evidence gaps between the sectors. We heard this, the silos, um, there's a lot of work going on, but it may be, very well be um, silos, when we hear uh, feedback from national action plan focal points, they often emphasize that they have challenges in finding governance structures, financing structures that can really support a One Health thinking and One Health approach to AMR. Um, Multi-sectoral and interdisciplinary research is very much needed in order to target this and um, I think this agenda, I mean, as I mentioned, it's an advocacy exercise for increased interest, but it's also a call to ensure collaboration, co-creation between the different sectors um, to really make impactful interventions. Yeah, so thank you. So I'll, um, okay. So we... Yeah, um, I think we do have time for a couple of questions if there. Yep. Again, nice presentation. We know that research doesn't happen in a vacuum. And what are the preparatory work on the ground in, in getting the platform ready for implementing the One Health you know, research? Thanks. That, that's a very good question. As mentioned, this is really the first step. This is a global exercise. It's very high level. As you could see, the questions can be interpreted in many different ways. And the priorities in the consultation process 
um, I was consulted in the different regions and it was very evident that the priorities were quite different. Southeast Asia was very concerned about uh, pollutions from, from plants, production plants. Um, our Manila office was concerned about the elderly burden and AMR in, in the elderly population, um, as well as climate change. Um, so so it, it will have to be, this is a global exercise, so it will have to be rolled out in a regional manner. Um, so it's it's just the first step. And, and also the exercise we'll do in a minute, it's a very open exercise. So there are no rights and wrong. It's more to get the, the thinking um, going. Okay. Thank you. Um, afternoon, I'm Faith from South Africa. What about viruses? What about I think I heard you distinctly talk about fungi and bacteria. Yeah, uh, viruses, that's definitely a big, I mean, resistance to HIV, resistance to virus, that's a very big problem too. Um, there's been more research going into that traditionally. And in, I mean, if we look internally in WHO, there's quite a big HIV uh, program and people looking at that. So it's not to not recognize that it doesn't exist and it's not important. The focus of this one is really the, the one health, uh, the circulation of the pathogens between the sectors. So it's it's the, uh, the classical bacteria and then not excluding fungi that has been the focus. But it's a, I, uh, to my knowledge, there has been a research agenda for, for HIV and they're looking at also resistance in a more systematic way. Showing us particularly the advent of zoonotic diseases. So I can accept the response that viruses have had attention up to now, and it's time perhaps to focus on other things. Yeah. But it just seemed a bit odd when we're dealing with so many viruses that are changing all the time to not even hear the word uh, mentioned in the presentation. Yeah. No, it, very good point. Just this, this just focuses on, on mostly bacteria and fungi. So it's not that the other part is not important, but this is the scope. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, then I think I'll start introducing the, um, if there are no more questions, I would introduce the group work. Okay, yeah, this is, sorry, this is my colleagues, uh, the names of my co the colleagues from the other organizations, uh, Francesca Latronico, Elisabeth Dalishwindel, and Susan Wong from UNEP. So these are the people who are involved in this uh, project. I mean, many more are involved, but this is the core group. Okay, so um, now I thought we'll uh, have a breakout session. And the objective is that you will, get a choice of, of three questions that are taken from the research agenda, and then try to bring it, break it down to one concrete research question. Um, then you will have to consider uh, how the gender and sex perspective could be included, as this is one of the cross-cutting issues in the research, especially keeping your mind on the end user of the research. And then consider which scientific disciplines that may be involved in this uh, AML One Health research and how they could contribute to the research. So that's the overall frame of the uh, exercise. Um, just to come back to gender, as I mentioned, it's a cross-cutting issue. And um, a few years back, WHO recognized that there was a need to understand and acknowledge how men and women and different groups in society are differently exposed to the risk of and affected by uh, AMR. Um, the, um, the tool that you will be working with is the gender uh, analysis matrix uh, that is planned to be adapted to come in as an annex in this uh, report um, in order to guide, uh, make sure that research proposals or research ideas do consider these aspects. 
Um, just talking about sex and gender, sex biological factors, uh, biological differences between men and women, epidemiology, disease burden, risk analysis, physiology, and then the gender that's linked to social cultural factors and access to healthcare and resources. So it could be formal, informal occupations, social, cultural, and political contexts, health seeking behavior, access to healthcare, and altogether access to resources. Um, yeah, and then basically in different language, who gets ill? Uh, what time of illness do men and women get? Uh, when do they get ill? Where do they get ill? And, and why do they get ill? Um, so I'm going to share with you, I also printed this out. This is an example from HIV AIDS. So this is the gender matrix. The first column is uh, its factors influencing health outcome. The first column is biological factors, stating that both men and women are at risk of HIV, but some groups, for instance, men of sex with men are at increased risk and heterosexual women are at increased risk due to biological factors and then different social cultural factors, stigma, discrimination, um, younger girls um, might be at higher risk of, of vulnerable to HIV. Um, and then the last part about access to and control over resources, which captures both access to resources, but also access to healthcare. Um, what we do know is, for instance, that women are 30% more likely to receive a prescription during their lifetime. Um, also, we know some, some of the infections like urinary tract infections are 10 times more common in women than in men. Women give birth um, and may have occupations where, the, where they're more exposed to river water um, or the farmers, the male farmers might, there might be many ways of stratifying. So I would ask you in the exercise to try to think about AMR, what, what could be the different differences between men and women, also age group. AMR hits like many infectious diseases, the very young and the very old, and then these different uh, age groups in between. Okay, so in a minute, you'll get um, uh, questions. So you need to choose one uh, area to work on. Ah, okay, no, this, sorry, this is, um, yeah. You need, you, you'll get one area to work on and you need to develop one research question. Um, then you need to, fill out the, the gender matrix where you find it relevant to fill out and then make a list of scientific disciplines that could be involved in addressing this research question. And if you think they would have a different research questions or aspects, please write that down. I have printed out these slides so, so you will have them as instructions for the uh, breakout sessions. Okay, so these are the three questions that will be worked on. So you will have to look at this quite broad research area and then consider one specific question under these umbrellas. So the first one has to do with IPC. Second one's what can we learn from climate change, COVID-19. Um, and then the last one about how can we, how can we um, replicate effective interventions in new settings. Um, I'll just give you an example. Um, I mean, bad examples. Anyway, the second one, what can we learn from COVID-19? A specific question could be, uh, did COVID-19 prevent efforts on hand washing reduce transmission on an, of an AMR relevant pathogen in country X? Or did uh, public awareness campaigns change people's behaviors on their hand washing in country X? And did that impact pathogen X in the community? So just trying to be more specific on the questions. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so this is just another question on the IPC. An example could be um, IPC, does IPC measures in hospital impact AMR residues? We already heard a bit about it today from the colleague in the, um, in the presentation earlier today. Um, AMR residues in effluent from hospital IPC compared to hospital with no IPC. And then from the human health perspective, you know, what, how would you stratify? 
thinking about other disciplines that may be involved, uh, modeling. Uh, is there a spread of AMR from hospital to the environment? Uh, does it spread widely, more than 10 kilometers? And, and what are the occupations that may be exposed to this, uh, the farm workers, others? And also behavioral science, what would they look at? You know, is how well is IPC implemented in the hospital? Are, are staff following the guidelines? Um, and who who's, who are the ones um, using the water that's very close to the, the, um, um, the hospitals? And like, why are men using the polluted water for their livestock? I think we already heard some examples today. But this was just some examples. I mean, you need to find your own question and own examples in the metrics. And just, yeah, I just give you, there are many scientific disciplines. These are just a few of them infectious diseases, environmental health, crop sciences, hydrology even. It could be many different um, disciplines that could contribute. Without further ado, very respectfully, I want to invite on stage the speaker representing group two as he makes his group presentation known. Put your hands together for him. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, uh, of the three questions, we decided to go with the behavioral one, which, if I remember, asked uh, what were what was it the, the third uh, the behavioral? I can't remember how the question was was worded. Can you hear me? Or okay, all right. So the question was, uh, what strategies can be used to uh, adapt effective behavioral interventions from one context to another. And uh, the particular uh, intervention, or actually I think we moved a little bit away from this, but we wanted to tackle the question of um, inappropriate use of antibiotics in African countries, um, particularly that uh, people tend to get access to these antibiotics at the point, point of access in pharmacies. Uh, so uh, over time, we, our, research our research question developed. So I guess we're cheating a little bit that we have two. Um, but the first question are, well, what are the drivers behind inappropriate antibiotic use? And particularly, we wanted to know that what if any, uh, are, uh, what if any attitudes, uh, what if any parts of the, the attitudes in the general population that are amenable to change such that they can result in appropriate antibiotic use in, in African countries? So when we consider different uh, different stratification considerations um, for what we may motivate different uh, different use of antibi different use of uh, antibiotics, uh, one factor, of course, is illness. If someone is ill, then their then the um, health seeking behavior will may be to to go and pursue or uh, to get antibiotics. Um, certain social cultural factors such as um, edu such as education. Um, Economics may include the cost of medication as well as uh, the ability to pay for actually the diagnostic tests and, and properly seek health uh, to re seek health care instead of uh, say going to a pharmacy to um, to get antibiotics and um, finally an issue of access to resources may matter as well the, the availability of actual health centers as opposed to um, local drug vendors. And uh, as a reminder, a reminder of our research question again, is that what if any uh, attitudes in the general population are amenable to be changed to say they result in appropriate antibiotic use? So um, it's quite a difficult question. So it would uh, require a fairly multidiverse, uh, multidisciplinary team, uh, sociology, uh, social scientists, economic, uh, economists, uh, animal health specialists, behavioral scientists, psychologists, sociologists, statisticians, epidemiologists, doctors and pharmacists, and public health specialists. I guess how, that's about how far we got, uh, yeah. Please, let's put our hands together for him. All right, we have these resource persons uh, on stage as professionals. Just among the lists, they might want to add a little bit of flavor to what the rapporteur for group two has said alongside team. And uh, we just want to have a very 
um, interesting conversation. The audience are free to ask him questions, and where he cannot um, answer, the resource persons will help out on this. So, question. Thank you very much, Group 2. I think very interesting. I'm just looking at the research questions, attitude. It's a very big, broad, sometimes might be difficult to determine. Could be factors, actually, in the general population that actually, you know, influence practice towards antibiotic use. And probably social determinants, if I may say. Um, the second thing, why is the focus in Africa? I think this is a problem that goes beyond Africa, and, and, and we need to understand this more. I, in, in when I come to the categorization according to the framework, mm -hmm. so you put illness. What do you mean by that? Is sex or biology has anything to do with these social determinants or, as you call it, attitudes in antibiotic use? The sex really or the biological factors has anything to do with that? So, thank you. Yes, over to you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I, if we go back to the how Tini frames this, this was actually is there anything we can use from other sectors? So, we, we chose attitudes because. Attitudes are things that can be changed. You know, what would make you think differently? We know there are many things that you are constrained by. So if you're poor or you don't have access to a doctor, you may just go and buy your antibiotics in the market. That attitude, that's not an attitudinal thing. It's, an atti it's a behavioral thing. So how does that translate? Well, so during COVID-19, when we were working with vaccine uh, people who are reluctant, the first thing you say is not, you know, you're stupid or you don't know or whatever. It's like, what would change your mind? What would you need to know that would help you change your mind? And in a sense, in a sense, and we only spend 20 minutes on this, there may be something le to learn from both vaccine reluctance work, the infodemic work that was done in COVID-19, and then the larger body of work, which has been done with anti-smoking. So with anti-smoking, you can tell people to you're blue in the face, don't smoke, you're going to die. But you can shift attitudes over time, and then you have to back them up with other things, like taxation, uh, restricting public smoking, and eventually attitudes then say, okay, it's too much hassle to smoke, I'll go and move. So that's the essence. We didn't capture it very well, but that's the essence of this. And there may well be that type of learning, both, say, within tobacco control, COVID-19, that could be adapted to this. Just to understand, I think it's a very small area about it's because it's very rare that it's an attitudinal thing about choosing antibiotics or not. It's often economics and opportunity and access and all those other social determinants. So in actual fact, this might be a quite a narrow, and even, and this will be my last thing, it may well be an area of research that can be closed down because it could be a big waste of money doing huge public health programs to say, don't use antibiotics, don't misuse antibiotics, because it's going to have no effect. It's not going to shift the needle, right? So that, so that would be good to know. No, I just, I just have a, I thank you very much for a very good presentation and summary of what we've done. I was very happy to see the very long list of different disciplines, and I think economics and behavioral economics is a, definitely one of the scientific disciplines that may be very relevant, relevant when you look at incentive structures and why do people buy, why do people sell antibiotics, and what are the whole financial structure when you look across One Health. So I was very happy to see quite a long list of different disciplines. Yeah, so so I think at this stage of the agenda setting, I guess, you know, you look at background questions. This is a very background question. It's not a foreground question. So it, it, it is vague. It, you need to transform this in contexts and countries into very specific questions uh, that will answer the question. So what are the drivers behind inappropriate antibiotic use and what can you do about it? 
when it comes to the attitudes, it's not just attitudes, for instance, of the general population, it's also attitudes of the prescribers. So it's important when you move forward in countries to look at, if you have this theme, then you have to define your population. Are you going to study the prescribers? Are you going to study the population? Which population? Are you going to look at uh, women? Are you going to look at men? Are you going to look at children? Rural, urban? So there are specific contextual issues. Uh, and I think uh, going into the specific uh, foreground questions at this stage is probably left to countries to decide. Uh, and if you can get the main themes, then countries have to adopt that. That's, so this, this is actually quite good. Uh, but you need to define your populations for enough of, it could be veterinarians, it could be farmers, and not just general population, it could be farmers, whatever. Wherever you've identified the key problem to lie, right? That's what you could target. Okay, excellent. So any more comments? Because otherwise I think we'll take the next. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. So the resource persons will remain seated as we make welcome the speaker of group three to make his presentation. Group three, please make welcome your speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm excited to be here for two reasons. Uh, the privilege to represent my honorable group, a uh, very diverse group. And also I came here as a delegate. So maybe you need to change this to presenter when I'm going back. Thank you, group three, you made it happen. So we, we focused on the behavioral insights and um, change theme because we thought it spoke to one of the issues that has been discussed so far today, the need to focus on the social side of things. Of course, the higher level molecular stuff is very important, but we think this is also very important too. So this is why we, we came this way. So um, our question is in the same domain as what we just sorry, listened to. And essentially we want to understand what are the reasons why patients expect or demand antibiotics when they see a prescriber in the various country contexts? And uh, we are taking this from two perspectives, the patient and then the prescriber. So we started this off with a simple relevance. I think most of you will identify with this story. So a patient travels several miles, maybe several hours, queues up you know, in a very busy hospital, finally gets to a doctor. He has a cold or a sore throat, and then the doctor says, I'm sorry, but you don't need antibiotics. So go home, drink hot tea. And the patient feels like, okay, so I came all this way for a motivational speech, you know. And this is a story that our group members all found very relevant in our setting. And so we think that this is something we, we think is worth focusing on. Uh, but at the same time, we think that there is also a reason why prescribers offer antibiotics when it may not be clinically relevant. So we are looking at, I would say, two perspectives, but it's actually four, because we want to do this for the human side and then the animal side as well. Okay, so the relevant stratifiers, so sex or gender, does it matter for the patient? Uh, do women have a certain preference for antibiotics as opposed to men? Are there any reasons? Um, if the patient is a child and it's the, it's the mother who is taking the child to the hospital, the mother is more proximal, perhaps feels the, child, the child's pain more than the father, as you would agree. So they will say, okay, I think my, my child needs antibiotics. Maybe the father might think otherwise. We don't know, but we have some anecdotal stories shared from our groups. And so we think that that's a relevant variable. The age, of course, um, important. For men, for instance, we think that maybe it's possible men might want one shot of an injection because maybe they are more tolerant to pain. Uh, forgive me if this is wrong, but I've seen, I've also seen men cry at the sight of a needle. Uh, Kweku is here. I haven't said, I haven't said anything, but Kweku is here. Uh, how about the occupation? You know, if I'm a medical doctor and I understand the dynamics, perhaps it will be easier for my colleague to tell me that, okay, I, I don't think your child needs antibiotic. I'll pick him up and take him away. But if you don't have the background I have, will it affect your, your choices or your preferences? 
the educational level, people's understanding or awareness about antibiotic, um, et cetera. Then the rural urban divide. In the urban area, there are more health seeking options, generally speaking, compared to a rural area. So if I am from a far off remote place, I travel all the way to the only health facility in my district and the doctor says, well, I think you have a viral respiratory tract infection, but occasionally this gets complicated by a bacterial infection. So for now, I think it's just viral. Let's adopt a wait and see approach. For me, this means I have to go home and come back again after a few days, spend money on transportation, further inconvenience. So maybe because of that, I'll say, no, I'll prefer you give me the antibiotics now. But if I live in an urban area where I have many options and it's easier to access healthcare, maybe I'll heed your advice. So we want to know how far this goes to affect usage patterns, et cetera. Access to healthcare, whether it's free or paid. If doctor tells me I don't have to buy antibiotics and I have cash in my pocket, I might walk to the pharmacy, right? But if I'm already broken, he says, I don't need antibiotics, hallelujah. I just uh, go home and drink hot tea, right? Okay. Are there any religious um, implications in this? We don't know. But we think due to the influence of religion and other conditions, uh, perhaps it's worth exploring here as well. Um, okay. So does this play a role in the success of interventions? We don't know. Next slide, please. Ah, okay, so on the prescriber side of things, there are years of practice, maybe younger or you know, relatively less experienced doctors might have a different prescribing party. Financial incentives, if the clinic is mine, all the revenue is mine, maybe I'll prescribe more. Um, the level of the health facility, higher centers tend to give more advanced drugs, et cetera. The type of practice or specialty of practice, I am a generalist. I'm more likely to give antibiotics to a child who doesn't need it than say a pediatrician, for instance. A surgeon is more likely to throw in all the antibiotics for a simple hernia repair, right? Forgive me if there are any surgeons in the house. Uh, and then the vet as well. Uh, the type of animal, if it's a food animal or commercial value, you know, they are more likely to use antibiotics, say in poultry. Uh, the chickens where I come from are very hard if they don't get sick anyway but maybe the chickens here might be given antibiotics every day, I don't know. Uh, so this is why the context also matters, obviously. Uh, we, you know, the discipline, relevant disciplines runs the gamut, but these are the ones we, we came up with and, and all the others my colleague mentioned as well also apply. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take quick questions if we have from the audience. I saw your hand first. Uh, nice presentation. Thank uh, you. I would, uh, from what you said, maybe there's one thing. I know you did think about it. Um, maybe it was just missing, like the education, uh, the educational level of uh, the person. Are they, you know, they are likely to have read somewhere that there are classes of antibiotics and are right. more powerful. So instead of uh, the amosacillin and amosaclav scenario, or even their uh, ability to also pay for that and other things. I know you did think about it, but I just wanted to. Uh, we mentioned all that. Quick. You sure? <laughs> you just wanted to. Hands up if you saw what Kweku is asking about. Yeah, pay attention. It's all right. OK, so another question from here. Um, yes, thank you so much. And uh, well done. Uh, yes, I just want to ask a question about your question, if you can flash me back to your oh, slide. You have a question about my question? About the questions, yeah. If so the slide with questions. Uh, if you can. No, no, it's off. It's off. Okay, I will ask as they flash it. Um, uh, in your formulation of your questions, is, is the assumption that the consumers of the antibiotics actually know them for what they are, that they are antibiotics. I hope you got it. Eh? Okay, so yeah, very good question. We did make one, uh, or we explicitly discussed one assumption that the use is inappropriate. Because if the use is appropriate, then the question is moot to begin with. 
So, of course, um, like we said, this is a high level conceptualization about the problem for now. But in the actual design of the tool, we will factor in um, issues like these to answer the specific question that you are asking. Uh, there will also be other relevant drugs, because, for instance, in my setting, people have the perception that certain drugs go together. Uh, funny anecdotes if um, you are a man and they see folic, some people see folic acid on your prescription, they ask, Really, are you pregnant? The assumption is that it's only for pregnant women. So, I mean, we'll certainly uh, feature this. In. Thank you. Any other question from anybody? Okay. Uh, panel? Do you have a comments on this presentation? Any idea you'd like to share? Is that better? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is another flavor of the previous question, I suggest. Uh, but also, it seems to suggest that all the onus here is on the, the consumers or the patients or the users. Um, and yeah, I think we can certainly focus on them. I'm not sure how much they effect they can actually have. And so the real problem, it seems, and I guess you'd have to look for the research, is to understand from the, each of their perspectives, what are their main drivers? And in our group, we focused on attitude because we thought that would be a smaller section of what's driving them. But the vast majority of them are likely to be driven by economics and uh, other types of behavior, like the expectation that if I go to a doctor, I'm going to get some kind of intervention. And I don't know how that's going to be changed. Um, so that, you know, it's just my sort of reflection on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I might just add that sometimes attitudes can be changed because of uh, access issues and because of the, the necessity for antibiotics. For instance, somebody in Afghanistan uh, during conflict, and I was in a clinic where, you know, the mother comes and says, I live five hours away, and when my child is sick, if I do not have reserve antibiotics with me, in case person, this child is going to die. What do you do? Attitude is an issue. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's important to understand that perspective and see how best the health system can change it. Huh? Okay. So when are you running your study? <laughs> <laughs> when are you funding the study? <laughs> okay, so maybe I can just complete, come up with a few comments before we need to uh, uh, close uh, just uh, this session. Thank you very much. I really liked all the stratification. I think it sounded like we had a lot of discussion about how to stratify and really think about different populations. And I think we had the discussion, okay, behavioral insights and change. You need to look at, you know, what is the behavior and how could it, potentially be, be diagnosed and addressed. But it's, it's really important to go back and see what is the problem? I mean, where does it lie? So thank you very much for your uh, presentation. And I think yeah, we have an... Right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lightning presentation that we want you to please listen to. To then... Hello, everyone. My name is Helen Mangoji. I'm a research nurse coordinator at the Malawi Liverpool Welcome Program. I'm here to present the work my colleagues and I conducted on exploring healthcare workers and patient caregivers hand hygiene practices in a neonatal refill unit in Blante, Malawi to explore implications for controlling outbreaks of drug resistant infections. We are all aware that neonatal sepsis is responsible for a considerable burden on of morbidity and mortality in low and medium income settings including in sub-saharan countries and is currently worsening due to the increasing rates of antimicrobial resistance amr inadequate ipc practices of healthcare workers and patient guardians and the conditions in the broader environment are important drivers of infection transmission in a context of healthcare provision so our qualitative work actually focused uh, on participants uh, observations and semi-structured interviews ssi to explore and understanding uh, barriers to implementation of optimal uh, IPC, focusing more on hand hygiene among guardians and healthcare workers present in this unit. 
and the participant observations were conducted to provide an in-depth understanding of activities relating to hand hygiene existing in this new NATO unit. So overall, we found that there were significant gaps between ideal hand hygiene and what healthcare workers and uh, patient guardians were able to enact. We found three key factors affecting hand hygiene practices, and this was at the health system level, individual level, as well as in the infrastructure levels, and these shaped behavior. However, substantial structural limitations and scarce of uh, resources, both human and material, made implementing this extremely challenging. For staff, the overwhelming numbers of patients uh, meant the workload was often unmanageable and in acting proper hand hygiene was often overlooked. The lack of access to soap and the erratic water supply in the unit made it almost impossible for both patient guardians and healthcare workers to maintain good hand hygiene. Further to that, communication challenges between different cadres of staff and with patient guardians meant that those handling new units and providing cleaning services in the unit were often unaware of outbreaks of drug-resistant infections and its implications. So in conclusion, we found that hand hygiene and broader IPC practices were shaped by factors at individual, health systems and structure levels. And for this to be improved, interventions needs to address the shortage of material resources and also create an enabling environment for healthcare workers as well as patient guardians. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we put our hands together for Helen? I think that was very nice. Uh, we'll take, okay, okay. Okay, all right. Group uh, Water Agingu. All right, let's put our hands together for the next speaker. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Group Three. Uh, Please, can we put our phones on courtesy mode to avoid disruption? So we, we want to break uh, transmission of AMR. And uh, oh. OK. So our research agenda question was, what is the role of genome sequencing in tackling emergence and spread of AM AMR? Yeah, so that was our, what is the role of genome sequencing in tackling emergence and spread of AMR? And the, request, the research question was, what is the role of genome sequencing in understanding the pattern of one health transmission and developing interventions in breaking the transmission from one sector to the other? And our target population are farmers. We are looking at the different farmers and how we can uh, work with them to break this spread. So we, relevant stratification considerations, we look at sex, not gender, but sex. So we realize depending on the bacteria we target, sex can play a role. Like for example, when we wanted to deal with the WHO recommended bacteria, like E. coli. So you find in females, E. coli is coming from stool and there is close proximity for it to contaminate the other side in females compared to men. So those, there are so many other bacteria which do that. So also we looked at uh, socioeconomic factors and we stratified the farmers into small farmers, medium farmers, and large farmers. We want to see can socioeconomic factors 
contribute in the spread. And if it is so, then we can use it to break the spread. Then what are the relevant disciplines? We want a lot of people involved. One, microbiologists, because we have to do culture and so on, sequencing also. And then molecular biologists will be very relevant in sequencing and interpretation. In fact, I, we forgot about bioinformatics and uh, we will add them there because this list is still growing and it requires your participation also. We need veterinarians, doctors, social scientists because we have to spread the gospel, policy makers, pharmacies, advocacy groups, religious groups, and local authorities. So we still have a lot of people we require, and that's what we had for now. I would like to thank, uh, I would thank the super group members who participated. Thank you. Quick question. Any question for group three? Anybody? Excellent. No question. Yeah, well done. Put your hands together. No question. Okay, you have a question. All right. Oh, do you still have a question? Okay. Okay. Um, I I didn't quite get how sex in human, the that transmission part, the genomic. I didn't get that aspect. Please, please elaborate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I I said depending on the bio, I mean, microorganism we have, because this is not going to be a one, one way. Somebody will tackle the other, but we gave an example of E. coli, Escherichia coli, which is one of the WHO recommended bacteria people are working with on antimicrobial resistance. Because E. coli is found in stool, human stool. So it is easier if we are dealing, are tackling E. coli, it is easier for it to contaminate the females. It can go to the reproductive organs and cause other diseases that, other than this. And then in the process, the, the, the woman can be taking drugs indiscriminately, then gets resistant, and then transmits it to the husband who might also transmit it to another side chick. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's all no, right. No. Uh, one of, a member of the panelists, audience, please. A I member of the panelists has something to say. Okay. I think uh, because your title was genome sequencing and how it will work. And I think somehow it's like something going in parallel. For me, it was a bit of a disconnect <laughs> because your title was good. And then you made it very broad. And then uh, somehow for me, the stratification does not go with the genome sequencing part. I don't know. No, what we did, we have to get samples from different people. For us to get these people, we can consider, do we need females to get the samples? or we need more males. So if we are doing E. coli, we could as well uh, consider working with women. Trying to do it in farmers who are females. Yeah, farmers who are females. That, farmers... that doesn't become very clear to me, at least. No. All right, we, we've got a hand here. We've got a hand here. Uh, Yes, there's a comment here for the discussion. Um, sorry, that's all right. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts about uh, sequencing, how, how, you know, the genomic sequencing revolution has helped to empower local sequencing? Um, I mean, so instead, it used, a few years ago, it was only big labs that could afford 
to have sequencing, high throughput sequencing, and now it seems that it's there's a lot more scope for sequencing at local level. How can that change things, do you think? Oh, thank you. We, we considered that we are coming from different countries and we realized that every country could be having some capacity. Not every hospital doing it, but at least a central hospital in every country could be doing sequencing. So in surveillance, we don't have to do it everywhere. We collect those samples and take to one place so that the sequencing can be done centrally. That's why we came up with sequencing and we were thinking of checking which the, the disease, where did they, it come from? Did it come from the animal to human or it came from human to animal? And then we see a way of breaking it. So sequencing is a problem, but every country could be having some capacity. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so suppose the resource person is supposed to be helping the presenter in defending the research question. But I think if you look at the AMR and the transmission, so the whole thing is a bit about breaking the, the, the cycle of transmission. Now, as we said, the, 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 the fair thing to do in order, or maybe the primary things to do in order to, to prevent infection, uh, to reduce transmission is prevent the infection in the first place. Now, depending on the type of bacteria, women might be more susceptible to the infections than men. And, and here, what we meant by this point. And I think the advances made in, in sequencing is well noted, I mean, during the COVID-19 pandemic and its role in developing vaccine, et cetera. And many labs now in developing countries are very advanced in, in performing genome sequencing. Thank you. Leno. Mine is, I'm a bit curious. Thank you for the presentation. Um, because you mentioned two things. Farmers that, um, what, what really will be done to the farmers, that one. And talking about gene sequ sequencing, we all know um, presently even in my country, so how, can sample be collected from human uh, from animal tested in so how the lab will be because we are talking about gene sequencing you know normally um human labs that run the gene sequencing don't test for animal if you send animal sample they won't run them for you neither you take um human sample send them to the animal they won't run so how will it be um if, uh, i need some clarification thank you Okay, before, before you intervene, let me try. Uh, <laughs> what, we, what we are talking about, I, I had one presenter talking about doing things differently. We want to bring one health together. So that is why we want to start. When we write a proposal for funding, let us see a way of harmonizing human people and uh, veterinarians. Me personally, I'm a lab person. And... Uh, given a chance and you train me, I can even run a, a chicken or a goat. <laughs> so, but, but because, because we, we have been in talk, we have been put such that a human lab person should be more superior than a veterinary makes us to be, behave that way. And that's what we want to break. We want to do it as a one health <laughs> where I can like, where I work, there's a lady who is running soil sequencing. She's running for, for microbiomes. So she's doing the soil, she's doing the stool, and I'm running it in my, in my lab. I made sure my people were trained to do that. So it's just a matter of orientation. Otherwise, we can be able to do it in one lab. Thank you. Thank you. His explanation was so complete that I, I have nothing to add. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, thank you very much, speaker. Okay. Zach. Just a quick, just a quick comment. I, I, I think the whole idea within One Health should be, can you trace the pathway of organisms between humans, animals, and climate? Yes. And there, the gen gene typing would be useful. You have a certain bug. Uh, if you can type that bug and follow its course from human beings into the 
the animals or into agriculture, which is then consumed again by animals, by, by animals and by humans, and then into the environment. And that cycle could be, uh, uh, be useful or amenable to being cycled. And ESDL tricycle project is an example of that. So it could be, you could have put it in that way that you're looking at one organism, which will go from the farm to the humans and then being translated. So yeah, the idea is there, but I think it needed a bit of time. No, but we just wanted to support our gender yeah. and yeah. make sure there's no bias. We, we need panel beating because, we need panel beating because this is the idea we should come out of this place with. Because my interest is surveillance, and I think it is going to carry the day. Yes. Okay. No. No. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's really nice to see that these questions are broken down to different elements. Next time we need a little more. <laughs> no, but thank you very much for bringing this very different perspective, breaking down the research question to something very important. <laughs> Where does transmission happen? <laughs> and what's the drivers and impact? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so the last group, one. Good day, everyone. Um, I'm Victoria. I'm presenting on behalf of um, Group One. So, so for us, we're looking at transmission. So that's um, what our focus would be on. Next slide, please. And yet, we adopted the same research agenda question, and that is: to what extent do infectious um, infection prevention and control practices, sorry, that's missing in one health settings, impact um, development of AMR use in the one health sector? So we are approaching it from the one health. Um, um, approach or perspective. Next slide, please. Oh. Okay. So for our research question, our research question is how does the lack of waste treatment affect AMR transmission in different communities? Building on what a um, lady had presented earlier, we saw that um, having a waste treatment um, plant reduced um, AM, AM bacteria in the effluent. Um, from those plants. However, we're looking at in communities, it's easy to have that because you have the structured plants, you have all of those, but in communities, when people um, dispose their waste, when they use, when you have open defecation, when you have um, people disposing drugs directly into the beans, into water bodies, um, when you don't, when there's a lack of effective waste treatment, how does that affect? And we're saying affect because we don't know whether it even in reduces or increases it, but our question is how does that affect AMR transmission in different communities? So we're looking at a community-based setting, not necessarily facility or hospital or sentinel sites. Um, next slide, please. So these are relevant uh, stratification considerations. So the first one we're looking at um, vulnerability to disease. And we know that in communities we may have, so biologically we may have immunocompromised people. Um, quite a number of us are from LMICs where we have, or some in sub-Saharan Africa, where we have a high burden of HIV and TB. So you already have people who are immunocompromised. Um, how does um, lack of waste management affect um, their own vulnerability to disease because if those sort of people take in the water or taking um, lettuce or salad vegetables as lady had said they definitely will be much more vulnerable to um, AMR and, or infections caused by drug resistant organisms and um, we're also looking at social cultural factors um, when you have displaced people a high number of displaced people where you have poverty occupational hazards and geographical locations like in our group where um, you have you may have people that um, live in swampy areas I know um, you have that um, you have those locations in Nigeria you have those in Uganda you have quite a number of swampy um, regions so um, how does how do all of those affect vulnerability to disease especially in areas where you don't have um, waste management facilities 
So for age, and as we all know, extremes of age always affect um, vulnerability to disease. But however, extremes of age, how does that affect AMR transmission where there is no, um, where there are no waste management practices or waste management or waste treatment um, facilities? Then for race and ethnicity, we said we are looking at. Um, or we think that some cultural practices may affect waste treatment or waste um, disposal or management strategies. So how do so we also want to investigate that? How does that affect waste management in communities? Then um, there are some studies that say some sets of people have genet genetic predisposition to um, AMR. So how does the lack of waste management in that setting increase the genetic dis predisposition to um, AMR transmission and the response to illnesses, people who have comorbidities, who have had transplants and distribution of labor and roles, people, different occupational hazards. So those people, people are involved in actually carrying out um, disposal of this waste um, in farming, using the water from the waste, um, from the effluents and all of those. How do all of those work together? to um, especially in a place where there are no um, where there is no um, where there are no standard waste management or waste treatment facilities and we're looking at it in communities in real communities where people live work and where they grow up and have all and carry out all their daily lives and businesses next slide please and yeah these are the scientific disciplines would um, we think would be important in this research from clinicians to community health extension workers to waste to regulatory bodies pharmacists, biostatisticians, all of them, um, social and behavioral change experts, all these disciplines put together would work together to answer the research question. Thank you. Um, questions? <laughs> questions? If questions, you have any please. Comments, yes. Comments? Can you go back to the stratification slide, please? My name is Matheus. I'm, uh, I'm working in uh, London. With <laughs> so <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Matheus Sahali. I'm working with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. Uh, so I, I want to know exactly because it's difficult for me to link both factors and the waste management. So it's like you have three things: you have those factors, waste management, and then um, I don't know how you make the link with, for example, immunocomposition. So how do you make the link with this and the waste management? So what we're saying is if you have immunocompromised persons in a community and that community does not have adequate waste management systems, those people are likely to, are more likely, or what we are saying, they, that hypothetically, they would be more likely to have um, and, um, drug resistant infections and would be also more likely to transmit it. So that is how we're looking at the fact of immunocompromised persons. So we're trying to link all of this to AMR transmission. So if they're in those kind of communities where there are no standard waste management practices, you may have them be more vulnerable to disease. So we're looking at it from vulnerability to disease, and I think immunocompromised persons would have more vulnerability to AMR infection. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, okay, uh, uh, let me be very brief. Wouldn't that be in the case that um, you're asking a question of which you're already giving an answer. If you try to ask, uh, try to compare it with a lady's earlier presentation where she did her work and uh, she, she gave us a scenario where they uh, may treat and uh, treat a treated, um, a treated uh, aspect. And now you're coming in and asking a question uh, in a case of a community setting where there's no treatment facilities. Yeah. And then later on, trying to give us a narrative that actually um, uh, the absence of these treatment facilities are going to influence to the positive increase of antimicrobials. Is it like you're asking a question of which you already know the answer? 
yes so so for ladies presentation she did it in like they had there was a structured plan so yeah there's water coming in they're treating the water and there's water going out but for us we're looking at in communities in the average community or in the average rural community in different across different countries we don't have that um or we want to ask do we have those systems in place and a lack of so in communities where you have a lack of those systems, how do that how does that affect AML transmission? So it's it has was just more, it was it was structured, but we are looking at in an unstructured community setting. Comments or questions? Okay, but then I say thank you very oh, thank much. You. Thank you very much. I, yeah, I, I, yeah so, so I just wa want to say thank you very much for all your hard work. I was very happy to see a lot of activity, a lot of discussion and the very different questions, solutions. And I think all of you brought different aspects to the exercise. So I was very happy. So I think key takeaways, I mean, the overall questions can be broken down to many different questions depending on what the priorities are and what your interests are. They will fit within the overall agenda. Secondly, I was very happy to hear the different stratifications ideas all the way from in the study design to thinking about the population you would look at to, um, to, to the policy implications. So I think it's just really important to keep thinking about can we stratify it in a meaningful way in order to do better research and better policy relevant uh, research. And I think also it came, became quite clear that implementation research is also needed. But I, yeah, for this exercise, I would really like to thank you for all your energy and enthusiasm and, and hard work. Thank you very much. Stronger collaboration between the clinic, the lab, and the pharmacy can ensure better antimicrobial stewardship. And this is a good stride in reducing antimicrobial resistance. How did we come to know that? Antimicrobial resistance is fueled in part by the misuse of antimicrobials in a hospital setting. With this in mind, a retrospective study was done to determine the trends in AMR with particular focus on urinary tract infections. The study period being 2019 to 2021 at Victoria Staple Provincial Hospital. The data generated from here was reported to the Hospital Therapeutics Committee in a bid to try and guide empiric treatment for UTIs. That discussion bred the following results. One, some of the drugs that the lab reported as useful were not available in the pharmacy or the local market. So they were not an option that the doctors could use. Did they give feedback? The platform for giving feedback was not being fully exploited because it was paper-based. And also, the recommended empiric treatment for phylonephritis in Zimbabwe makes use of ceftriaxone and gentamicin. However, these drugs saw a 30 to 40% increase for ceftriaxone and 50 to 70% increase in resistance for gentamicin. So these drugs are becoming less and less useful, bringing out the need for continuous surveillance for drugs being used as empiric treatment. So what was the immediate action taken after this was noticed? Firstly, a monthly lab pharmacy liaison was created whereby the pharmacy flights out the drugs that are available and the lab then uses these for antimicrobial susceptibility testing. Then a WhatsApp platform was initiated for real-time dispersal of agent results as well as real-time feedback for the usefulness of these results between the clinic and the laboratory. And because this WhatsApp platform is not so secure, this led to the development of the AMUSE initiative where an app is being created to use AMR surveillance data to guide purchasing and prescription practices in the clinic. 
This work was done by Mr. John Barney Jr., Mr. Kate Lovu, and Mrs. Catherine Zinoera. Good day. My name is Julian Yamupachitu from React Africa. I'm going to be talking to you today about mobilizing youth in Africa for action on antimicrobial resistance through a leadership program. AMR is a major global threat to public health, food security, and development today. The Gram report published earlier this year provides a helpful global estimate of the burden of AMR with Sub-Saharan Africa facing the highest burden of AMR. AMR requires that uh, multi-stakeholders come together to address this global threat. And one important stakeholder are actually the youth. Young people are an important and valuable stakeholder in addressing the global health threat of AMR, since they are the next generation of public health professionals, the potential future antimicrobials, prescribers, users, stewards, and policy makers in their professional practice. REACT, which is Action on Antibiotic Resistance, works as a catalyst for action on AMR and uses a One Health approach to target a variety of stakeholders in using a One Health approach. One of the key stakeholders that REACT Africa targets are students, right from the elementary to tertiary level, with the aim to raise their awareness in AMR, to inspire and mentor them to be agents of change. In 2021, we piloted a program called the Antimicrobial Resistance Leadership Program for tertiary students in Africa in partnership with Students Against Superbugs Africa. Uh, we did, the methodology that we used is that we advertised for this program via um, student networks, including utilizing social media, emails, and we did get over 300 applications with Uganda leading the highest number of uh, applications for the countries of students that applied. And we ended up having 100 students enrolled in the program after going through the applications. And the goal of the program is actually to have empowered student leaders in Africa who are problem uh, solvers and solution providers for the antimicrobial resistance global health threat. And 91 students from eight African countries successfully completed this program, which started with an online course from the React Africa uh, website. And also we had um, virtual sessions where experts came in to talk to students on various topics, including antimicrobial stewardship, infection prevention and control, uh, AMR and sustainable food systems because we're using one health uh, lens in the topics that we selected and we also had them um, have uh, leadership training skills and all the soft skills including project management, monitoring and evaluation, design thinking. And the students were then um, did experimental learning in their different contexts. So we actually have seen quite a number of success stories following these sensitization sessions. These are um, all summarized on our Website, we do have a website for this leadership program with a link below that we're actually encouraging you to visit so that you can learn more about the work that students have been doing as AMR champions across the African uh, region. And you also, there's also a section where mentors can actually apply to join so that you can mentor in a way to learn from the students at this, they also learn from you. So whoever is interested in becoming a mentor, it would be a good thing to visit the site and also apply. And we learned that students are creative, committed and passionate about being AMR champion. And there is need to leverage on their initiatives and also support them. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I am Yusuf Obatsley from Nigeria and I'll be presenting our paper titled A Review of Sub-Saharan African Countries Preserving Summer Curriculum to Identify Training Gaps on Antimicrobial Use, Resistance and Stewardship. To give a bit of a context, pharmacists are an important part of the healthcare team and they have active roles toward improving and ensuring rational use of antimicrobials among consumers as well as healthcare professionals. Therefore, Preservice training and education of undergraduate studying pharmacy on AMR control strategies has the potential to enhance the quality of these future pharmacies. Our paper aims to identify the current status of AMR in their curriculum, identify gaps that exist, 
and to also provide recommendations to stakeholders on how to inte integrate or update AMR specific content into the, into the pre service curriculum. For our method, we conducted a narrative review to our time of the study. Data reported in this article was obtained from literature in peer reviewed journals using the following key terms. Then we also searched about five biomedical databases, including Google Scholar PubMed, Medline, Med, um, Web of Science, and PubMed Central. Then the papers were critically as, um, assessed for intellectual content, and those that did not meet the digital criteria were excluded. In addition, the online version of the curriculum was searched for the pharmacy schools in South Africa, Africa, and those that are publicly available were also reviewed to make this review much more comprehensive. For our results, the curriculums used in ph for pharmacy students in South Africa, Africa were not comprehensive enough. Although antimicrobial use and resistance were introduced in the early stages of the pharmacy school, and but this covered just the definitions of antimicrobials, the classes of antimicrobials, their indications, their use in veterinary medicine, their duration, as well as drivers of resistance. Most of the curriculums excluded antimicrobial stewardship, excluded how to dispose antimicrobials, and the students were not even exposed it to infection prevention and control, as well as measurement of antimicrobial consumption, amongst others. In conclusion, the core EMR components that we acquired by pharmacy students is inadequate across the South Africa. Then we therefore propose or we recommend that the curriculum should be compared with the WHO EMR competency framework so as to be redesigned, refocused, and reoriented to meet the identified gaps in EMR knowledge, skills, and attitudes. We believe this will build a new generation of competent pharmacists on matters relating to antimicrobial use and resistance. Thank you.